The date is November 24th, 2013. The uh, person we're interviewing is Edith Ressler. She likes to be called Susie. I'm the interviewer. My name is Anne Bernard. We're interviewing um, Susie in Bala Kinwood, Pennsylvania, in the United States of America, and we're speaking in English. Hi, uh, today is November 24th, 2013. I'm interviewing Edith Ressler. She likes to be called Susie. We're interviewing um, in Bala Kinwood, and my name is Anne Bernard. The interview is taking place in English. Good afternoon. Could you tell me your name, please? Oh, my name is Susie Ressler. Is that the name you were born with? Uh, no, I was born in Sitro, which is uh, that's my name, my maiden name. Subsequently, I got married, and my name is Ressler. How do you spell Citrum? C z i t r o m. And Ressler. R e s s l e r. And when were you born? I was born November 19th, 1927. Where? In Oradea, uh, Transylvania, which is, was in Romania at that point. And what, um, what kind of a um, background did you come from in terms of the town and the family? Well, Oradia is a, is a city in that part of the world. It wouldn't be a city in the United States uh, considered. I don't think so. At that point, it had about 100,000, give or take, uh, inhabitants. And of that, one third were Jewish. Uh, I was the first born child of a young couple uh, who were uh, uh, kind of high middle class or, or middle class and uh, uh, were bell, uh, very comfortable circumstances. Uh, and then uh, I had a brother who was born uh, three years later and uh, we were a very happy family. What were the names of your father and mother? Uh, my father's name was Dejer, which uh, doesn't really have an English name, and my, no my mother was Elizabeth. Could you spell his name for us? D-E-V-S-O, umlaut. And was he from that area to begin with? He was from another area of Hungary, not very far. And your mother? My mother was also from another area of Transylvania, and uh, it was uh, maybe 60 miles or something from my city. What made them come to Aredia? Uh I wouldn't know. I was born there by there. And what was your brother's name? Uh, my brother was George or Laszlo George. And when specifically was he born? He was born uh, April uh, 2nd, uh, 1931. Your grandparents, can you describe the, the family beyond your parents? Well, my father's uh, family, uh, my grandmother died when I was uh, four or five years old. I have a very vague recollection of her. Uh, my mother's parents were alive. My mother's father was an educator with a very big uh, uh, respect uh, by, his, by his colleagues and by his students. And uh, my grandmother was a housewife, of course, because she had seven children. And I think that at that time, uh, an age uh, that was what was expected of a woman. 
How did you know that your grandfather was so respected? Uh, I used to spend uh, some of my vacations uh, at my grandparents' house because uh, at that point my grandfather had Lou Gehrig's disease and uh, so uh, in order to have somebody in the house and, 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 and read for him, uh, I would spend uh, most of my vacations there, and uh, including Christmas vacation and uh, summer vacation. And uh, there was a steady flow since he had Lou Gehrig's disease and he wasn't, uh, he was more or less bed, bedridden. Uh, there was a steady uh, flow of people, of some of them kind of high situated judges and, and, and lawyers and, and doctors, and came for advice to their old uh, teacher or, or, or professor who, uh, who was bedridden. And I really can't figure out what he could uh, contribute because uh, he wasn't out there in, in, in the life, you know, for years. But they, they came, and so I know that he was very well respected. What did he teach? I don't know. By the time I, I he was bedridden, by the time, more or less bedridden, by the time I was, uh, I remember, or I was born. I, I really don't know when he started or when, you know, but I... Uh, what language did you speak to him? Uh, oh, wait, please. All right. What language did you speak? Hungarian or German. He also spoke uh, Slovak, but I did not. Uh, I learned how to read about uh, when I was five, uh, five years old and read the newspaper every day to him. And uh, that really made me very important and, uh, and very happy. And it made him very happy. What was his name? Uh, I guess he was Miksha, I, Maximilian, I think. And his last name? Uh, well, his last name, he was born Cohen, but then he changed his name to Curtis. Uh, and I really don't know uh, what year, or, uh, but my, his children were born, and they, their birth certificate is Curtis. You know, Could my you mother's birth certificate is Curtis. Could you spell that, please? Uh, K-E-R-T-E-S-V. It's a Hungarian. It, it's a Hungarian uh, name. It it means uh, gardener, actually. What language did you speak at home? Uh, well, uh, when I was a, a, a child, my mother spoke Hungarian. Ooh, I had a nanny, and she spoke German. She was a German lady from Berlin, and. Uh, we had a housekeeper who spoke Romanian. I happened to like the housekeeper a lot. She was very warm, or I, I don't remember, but uh, I know that I liked her. And I spent as much time as I could in the kitchen where I had no business being, and uh, learned how to speak Hungarian, Romanian. Uh, so I guess by the time I could speak, I, I, I spoke three languages more or less. Why do you say you had no business being in the kitchen? Well, uh, children have no, not really, in a, in, a, in a household where there is a nanny and there's a mother and there's a housekeeper, a small child has not much uh, use or, or should be in the kitchen. She just gives people back, not... <laughs> It does not really, I, I don't think that the kitchen was part of my, uh, where I, I was supposed to be. You said that your family was um, upper middle class or middle class. Could you describe what that means for us? Well, uh, it, 
that if we cannot be translated into the United States as far as uh, social economic groups. Uh, on the other hand, I know that my my uh, my parents had uh, a certain name. Then, I, if I went to a store or something, and I am a, a, the Citroen girl, uh, oh yeah, what can I do for you? So on and so forth. So I figured that that was good. Uh, by the way, I could do that uh, since I was eight or nine years old. Uh, uh, you you could freely walk in the town and 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 uh, be very independent. Uh, if your parents allowed that, and uh, and I know that uh, originally, when I think back of my early childhood, we did not have any financial difficulties. Uh, I don't. I don't think that we have any financial difficulties even later on, but uh, uh, the laws were different, and uh, and so. Uh, in order to be able to maintain or uh, live a normal life, you kind of had to skirt the law, which I suppose my parents did. I would like you to explain that a little further. What do you mean by skirting the law? Well, uh, there were uh, all the laws passed in the 30s, and especially in the 40s, was uh, restricting Jewish people from doing various things, including having a housekeeper of a Christian faith, uh, or having even employees of Christian faith. And uh, so slowly but surely, I remember that uh, our housekeeper became a Jewish girl, there were a lot of poor Jewish people, so uh, that there was no shortage of that, and especially not during the war years. And uh, uh, also, uh, according to the Jewish laws, uh, Jewish enterprises did not get allotment of raw material, so uh, somehow or the other had to be the black market of whichever or connections that allowed you to to have it. And so that's what I mean by skirting the law. When you talk about the um, nanny, uh, do you remember her name? Gertrude. But uh, she was there only, uh, well, uh, she was called back to Berlin, so whatever it is. So I, I don't really remember what year that was, but uh, she, uh, she was there when I was. Uh, so I remember her, but I, I don't remember when she wasn't there. What did, the, what did you do with the nanny? Well, the nanny was there to dress you when you were little, and then later on to, to uh, accompany you to school and, and to take you in the afternoon to the park to play with the other children and her to to have a meeting with the other nannies and uh, I mean that's what basically it was just for the child and and and, and of course her one of her duties were, was to for us my brother and myself to learn German uh, if you know that was the germ that was the language that she spoke to us, and uh, we so that this is why I feel that that is one of the languages that I always spoke. I don't remember. Could you describe the apartment that you lived in or the home? Well, it was a nice one. We I had uh, my mother's piano, which was a Bösendorfer, which was a very nice piano, and uh, that was sit situated in the salon, which was so-called salon, which was a, an impossible room. I don't think it was good for anything except for sitting there very stiffly. And uh, uh, my parents had a bedroom, and we had uh, we had our rooms. It, it wasn't as uh, 
spacious as an American uh, home, or uh, you know, it wasn't that uh, every child should have a, a room, and uh, that wasn't part of the European uh, uh, living. But it was a very nice home with uh, with uh, a lot of amenities and. Uh, with a laundry room downstairs in the basement, and once a month the laundress came, and she did uh, all the washing and ironing. Uh, so uh, I remember going to the basement and watching, because there were no washing machines, or uh, even the iron was a, a coal iron that had to be heated and uh, kept clean. So. Different world. Did you live in a um, house that was separate or in a, an apartment in a building? We lived in, uh, part of my childhood we lived in a villa, in a house that was separate, you know, just a villa with a garden. And uh, subsequently the place where we lived later was uh, a two two apartment house that uh, we had a center uh, hallway, a uh, center uh, front door. On one side it was one family, on the other side was another family, and uh, the basement and the uh, uh, belonged to this this side and to that side. It, they they were not common or anything. Uh, why that's where I was taken to concentration camp from. So that was the last place where we lived. Why did you move from the separate house? I don't know. It had something to do with my uncle getting a divorce and uh, subsequently moving uh, in with us and having a room there, and uh, but I don't uh, really know the details. I just know that it was so. How long did your uncle live with you? Oh, maybe a year or two, I don't know. Then uh, he married his secretary. So I guess that was uh, part of his divorce. I really don't know. Describe to me your room in um, in both homes. Uh, I don't remember one. Number one, I don't remember. Number two, uh, I had the shed lounge, it was called, which uh, was a very comfortable bed kind of at night, but during the day it was uh, something like a sofa in a way. And uh, and it had uh, it had a desk and it had a it had a closet of some sort. I yeah, it did have a closet and a mirror in the middle and uh, and some chairs. I don't even remember that. Though. How about the toys? Oh, we had toys. We. Uh, the toys were not as sophisticated. We had a lot of books, and uh, children's books with pictures, and later books with. Uh, that was, I think, one of my main places where I escaped. And uh, I had dolls. I had a teddy bear, whose eye, whose eye, I, one eye, I, I removed. <laughs> And uh, so we had all the, I had all the kind of toys that other people had at that time at that place. Uh, we had uh, uh, bicycles, we had roller skates, we, we, in the winter we were skating, so uh, we had, uh, we had most of the things for the age, not, not for today. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean by my my grand grandchildren or my great grandchildren had uh, electronic toys and and all, all kinds of other toys, which we didn't have. 
And I, I am not sure whether in America children did or they did. Uh, most uh, America was much more advanced uh, at the time when Middle Europe was still uh, in uh, the Dark Ages or something. So you can't, uh, you can't really translate. But I, I never felt deprived, so I know that I had all the toys that the other children had. How would you describe the general atmosphere in your home? Well, it was very nice while it lasted, but after a while, it became uh, that the grown-ups were talking to each other in very subdued words, uh, so that the children don't hear, or we, you know, and and uh, and there was sometimes you could hear feel that they have fear. They, uh, you know, the, all the all the news from Germany, the, all the news from uh, uh, at that point uh, we had the love, we had the radio that. Uh, uh, was catching uh, the BBC from London, and the BBC from London was uh, uh, telling all the atrocities what the Germans did and what they didn't do, and what they, you know all, all the new laws and all. Uh, so, uh, and we also got uh, the German uh, uh, Rundfunk, which uh, was. Uh, there was no television, but there was there was a very very good radio, and uh, so as things became worse in various places, I think that uh, the grown-ups became more and more subdued and and uh, maybe fearful. Or uh, I just know that uh, that uncle, the uncle that lived with us for a while. He was the oldest brother of my bro my father, and uh, he was actually uh, of age when my grandfather died. So the little ones were his uh, wards, and so it was a uh, used in and in that family. It was that you discuss everything with uh, with Shamu, which was my uh, uncle, and uh, he used to come over and. Right away, my father and him, they, they went into the other room and, and they were talking and, and uh, but they, they never smiled afterwards. They came out, they were, they were really uh, like wrapped in, in problems. It, uh, it wasn't uh, like it was before. What, well, how old were you about that time? Uh, well, during the 30s, I, I was, uh, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, I was a very perceptive child, and even so, I didn't understand what they were talking, and I did not. Uh, I knew that something is not right. Other than that, I really didn't know what wasn't right. Basically, later on, I, I listened much more carefully, and I understood much more. And also because I read the newspaper to my. On my grandfather, I had uh, kind of all the news, and also also the radio. I mean, when they had uh, the BBC uh, on, uh, sometimes they allowed me to, to to listen. They figured they I don't understand it anyway. You described to me that your family was very strict with parents were very strict with the children. Could you? Tell I don't us about think that. that they were more strict than uh, I believe that my mother was raised that way, and uh, so therefore she raised us that way, and uh, she, she, they weren't that strict, but they expected us to behave. Uh, they allowed us to be children, but not to be children at the table, or to be children. Uh, when they had company. So you, we learned how to behave properly, which I think it was good. How did that manifest itself? What did they do to teach you to behave? 
But they talked to us. There was uh, long, uh, lengthy conversations, uh, and by uh, example, they uh, respected our time when it was our time, or when we did homework, or or uh, you know, it didn't matter how important it was for them to do something. It was our time. So by respecting us, I think we learned how to respect them or, or the world. Were you punished in any manner? Um, well, my mother had uh, kind of fast hands, just just a little bit, you know. Not uh, I was never beaten or anything. I can't say that, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was. Uh, I, I really wasn't a very uh, a model child because I was very uh, tomboyish, and uh, so therefore uh, I was on the carpet a lot. How did you feel about that? Uh, well, sometimes I felt that uh, it was right, and sometimes I felt that it really was my fa my brother's fault, but. I took the punishment because he was a very modest little boy, shrewd, and uh, he he made it sure that it never pointed to him, but uh, pointed to me. And uh, he was he was he was a much more quiet boy. I, I wasn't very quiet. They used to say that I have uh, mercury in my veins instead of blood because I was very moved. You know, I was always in movement. What's your favorite memory of your families being together at dinner? Uh, I suppose Friday night. Uh, Friday nights, uh, not every Friday, but most Fridays, my father and my brother took my brother to the synagogue. And uh, I stayed with my mother. The dining room table was set, and we sat at the table and and prayed la and and uh, uh, the, whatever it appropriate for Friday night. And uh, then my father and my brother arrived home, and we had the main Friday meal at that point. Uh, later on, when there were a lot of refugees, we never knew how many people we were going to have for dinner, you know, because my father picked up some of the people that uh, didn't have where to go. And uh, so, but before that, before the refugees started to come, I think it was a very nice Friday night. My mother lit the candles and, and, and uh, taught me how to pray and uh, how to do everything. And uh, so it was a very, very nice thing with my mother together and, and then with my father and my brother. What were some of the foods that you remember having? On Friday night? Well, my brother was a very poor eater. And... Uh, so our, I think our diet was more or less uh, so that if if you have children, so that that more or less you adjust something for the children, kind of, or, or more or less for the children. And so we had a lot. Uh, my father, my brother liked uh, hamburgers or, or uh, ground meat, whatever it is. And uh, uh, so we had uh, a ground chicken uh, made into a, uh, uh, made into an aspect, you know, a cold uh, uh, dish. And uh, we had uh, uh, Friday night. We did. Not, we had Friday night soup. Sometimes, but not very often, and roast and uh, roast, and and we always had cake on Friday. Who made the cake? 
uh, uh, the housekeeper did make the cake usually. You know, it, it wasn't uh, uh, Sunday if they had company, then that was more elaborate. It was like a cake cake, you know, like a bakery cake. And uh, we had a very uh, able housekeeper until 1940. It's, that's when uh, the first laws, the first laws came that uh, Jewish people cannot have uh, Christian uh, housekeepers, and she was very good. And I, I, I remember that her cakes were very good. What was your favorite food? I don't think I, I think I liked food. Period. We'll continue in a few moments. Let's talk about, Susie, let's talk about um, Shabbos in your home. Well, uh, Shabbos in my home was, uh, we slept late. Uh, we usually we we, we went to uh, I, we didn't go to school and and uh, so uh, Shabbat was the, the day that we slept late, maybe eleven o'clock or something. It really really late, and uh, and. Uh, Well, maybe it is it. She's out. I think I heard her walk out. Can I answer? Yeah, maybe there's another bathroom she could use if, if she needs to do that, rather than the one in the. Could you tell us how um, you observe the Sabbath in your home? Uh, well, as I started to say, that we slept late on Saturday, and. Uh, uh, then we had lunch, which was the main meal. Uh, we usually had uh, a dish that you had to go to the, uh, on Friday you took it to the bakery and they put it in the ovens. And then on Saturday lunchtime, you went to the bakery and you picked it up, the pot with the with the dish, with the beans and beef and, uh, and, uh, and all the goodies. Uh, uh, winter time that was more or less because uh, you did not cook on Saturday and so therefore this was a hot meal on Saturday fresh kind of freshly cooked because it just came out of the oven and uh, so in the winter time in the summertime not uh, not really mostly not very seldom but other than that we did no we had more or less a cold uh, lunch, and uh, and in the afternoon uh, I would be playing. I didn't have to take any lessons on Saturday, so that was my day of rest. <laughs> uh, my mother usually had a, her le her friends over, and uh, I really don't know what my father did. Uh, on Sunday. They used to have sometimes couples over, and and uh, but Sunday I had some lessons, so I, and, and I had to also learn how to cook and bake, and uh, so that was my job on Sundays. But Saturday I, I I just could play. What kind of lessons are you talking about? Well, I don't remember which day it was, you know, but I, I took a lot of lessons. Language lessons, uh, piano lesson, gymnastics, uh, dancing lesson. Uh, I don't even remember what else came out down the pike, and and my mother made sure that I participate. So, uh, how many lessons did you have at home with a tutor, and how many? Well, I never had a tutor at home. Only the piano teacher came to the house, but uh, every le other lesson I went to the teacher. Uh, it's not a big, it wasn't a big city and, uh, and uh, at that point I had good legs. 
So, uh, but uh, they didn't come to the house, none of them. The only, the only tutor who came to the house was uh, the guy who prepared my brother for bar mitzvah, and then he was never bar mitzvah because uh, in four, uh, 44, uh, he would be bar mitzvah on, uh, in April. And by that time, the Germans were there, and uh, and uh, and we had a Jewish star, and that wasn't very safe to be on the street, and uh, so so she ne he never had a bar mitzvah. He did, for the bar mitzvah, they went to the synagogue with my father, and I don't know what he had, but uh, we weren't there, and and uh, he he really didn't have a bar mitzvah. What kind of a relationship did you have with your mother? as opposed to your father? Um, I think I adored my father. I loved my mother, but I didn't adore her. And uh, I had a, to, toward the end, I had a closer relationship with, actually, I always liked my father. Because I understand that when I was about two and a half or something, uh, I walked away and I went to my father's store by myself, crossing streets and everything else, uh, because he used to tell me very nice stories. And, uh, and my father sat me down and told me a story. And my mother arrived very worried that she lost me, and I am sitting there. I think that was their first fight, that how come he didn't take me home? But I suppose I, I really always loved my father, but, you know. And uh, toward the end, toward, uh, uh, we kind of, had also a friendly relations. He, he he kind of trusted me and 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 talked to me like uh, more or less like an equal, even so I wasn't. But uh, uh, I think that that's what I remember most. What kind of a store did he have? Oh, the haberdashery when I was a, a child, a little you know that was before. Uh, he had that until. Uh, I don't remember what the year, but uh, at, at, at one point afterwards, when they started the knitting, and uh, you know, not right away, but uh, he gave the haberdashery to his two, to his two brothers. And uh, he was only occupied with the, with the factory, you know, to knit things. But uh, why did he give up the haberdashery? Well, he, his brothers needed, uh, his brothers lost uh, their job. It was, uh, they, I don't really know what they did before, but because of, of Jewish laws, first the one and then the other one lost uh, whatever they were doing. And uh, so they needed something and he didn't need, you know, uh, uh, siblings were much closer, uh, kind of, sometimes closer and sometimes further than uh, they are today. Because uh, when you have uh, things to worry and, and, and things don't go that well, then siblings go closer together. and. Uh, so I think that was a natural thing for my father to do that, uh, help them out, you know. They were his brothers. And tell us about the knitting company. Well, my mother spent, I think, six months in uh, Nochikaro, which is the city that uh, my uncle had a, the factory. Uh, it wasn't really a factory factory, I mean, in, in the American sense, you know. But it was a, a, a big shop. It's, theirs was a bigger, bigger shop. And uh, uh, 
she, she learned the basics, and, and uh, my mother was very handy altogether, and she had a, a fantastic knowledge of uh, how to learn, not languages, but how to learn anything that went through the hands. She, and uh, so uh, you saw my needle points, and, and uh, it's part of it is hers, part of it is mine, but she taught me how to do it. And uh, uh, so uh, at that point, uh, she was uh, the inside person. She was the person who, who, who was there day in and day out, you know, inside. And my father was mostly outside, you know. What kind of knitwear did they manufacture? They made uh, lady sweaters because uh, they had these uh, covered buttons, which was in style at that time. And I know that uh, that's why I remember the lady sweaters. And they did some children's uh, uh, outfits, which uh, uh, I think it, it consisted of a, of a pair of pants and a, and a pullover and a hat and maybe little gloves. Uh, the gloves were usually made by outside uh, uh, various ladies had this little machine that made gloves. They would come in, get the yarn, and take it home. And the next week they would come back with the finished gloves and uh, lately, later my job was to weigh the yarn for them and weigh the gloves back to and, and pay them for each pair of gloves. And uh, the gloves were never made uh, in that place. You know, they always made by these ladies who, uh, because they had children and they, they couldn't have a job and, and uh, so that was a way of uh, supporting uh, or, or substituting whatever you know they needed. Who did they sell the knitwear to? Um, well, I, I know that they sold to the to the uh, stores uh, in the city, and possibly, and and I know that they sold to the store uh, after after. A while they sold sto uh, in Budapest when we in, after 1940 when we became hungry. Uh, to I suppose uh, I don't know if they were a wholesaler, so they were uh, uh, that it wasn't a department store, but it was a, a stores that uh, that uh, had this kind of stuff, you know. I suppose ladies stuff, or uh, I don't know what they had. What was the name of the company? I don't think they had a name. I, I really don't think that they had a special name. I don't remember. How many years did they have this company? Um, I think from uh, sometimes the late thirties or the thirties, sometimes, and until uh, we went. Uh, until uh, the Jewish laws came, and uh, until the Germans came, actually, until 1944. And it was a successful business? I suppose so, because I remember it as, as fruitful. I don't remember uh, uh, problems with uh, having to eat or, 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 or that kind of, you know, problems. What kind of machinery was used? Uh, well, I don't know. I suppose it's German, but I'm not sure of that. Who worked in the in the uh, factory? Well, we had uh, we had uh, well, there was the the knitters who used to do the machines, and there were the a uh, girl who ran, uh, see, uh, there was a, a machine that put uh, the 
yarn on spools so that they can connect it to the knitter. So that is a machine that was run by usually a, a girl. And uh, then there were afterwards, uh, it was, uh, the material was cut to, you know, because it was neat to size, but, but even so there was a, and then there were the machines that uh, formed the, uh, the side seams and the other seams and, and then the girls who put the buttons on. So there were various people. It was uh, mostly uh, the, the knitters were male and the, and the seams that, so-called seams that says they were, they were only the girls. How many people would you say that would be all together? I don't know. I don't know because it was various times. The, in the beginning, we, they, they, there were uh, various people, uh, people who worked before in it their factories, uh, you know, uh, they wanted to change jobs, but they, they were, they knew how to do certain things. Uh, subsequently, the Jewish laws came into effect, and then uh, uh, slowly but surely every, everybody became Jewish, and, and they were trained to do those things. So, uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it was various hands that it went through, so they had to be, I don't know. What kind of responsibilities did you have as a um, daughter of this family to help out in the factory? Well, uh, when I came home from school, uh, many times I would, I would do uh, this uh, glove uh, uh, transaction because that was a, a tedious job. Uh, it, it was, uh, uh, it had to be accurate and uh, because yarn was very difficult to get. So uh, it, it, it basically, you had to make sure that you get as many gloves as, as a yarn you gave out because, uh, not only because uh, uh, that's uh, thievery or whatever it is, but basically because uh, uh, the yarn was precious uh, beyond its worth. It was hard to get. Where did it come from? I don't know. I really don't know. But I do know that some of it came from Budapest and, and uh, then the finished material, finished stuff went back to, to I think the same company. And I don't think that uh, he was supposed to give us the yarn, but, uh, uh, but I know that after, after the show, after the, when I uh, was liberated and, uh, and uh, I went to Budapest and I looked him up and uh, I told him that my father was killed and he was crying. He, he wasn't Jewish, but uh, you know, of course he wasn't. But he started crying. But he says, I love that man. He was a very nice, honest man. We, we dealt with it for years, and, and uh, we had a very good, nice relationship, and, and uh, I, I wish I could have done something more for him. And he started crying. So it happened. There were people who were kind of humane humans. Tell us about the schooling that you have from your earliest recollection. What kind of school and... Well, my grandfather uh, made it a rule that all his grandchildren have to go to Jewish parochial school uh, for elementary school at that point. And, uh, if it's, if it's available in the city where you live, because everybody, every, all his children lived in different cities, so it's not, it wasn't available every place. So when I started school, I started with the, 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 with the Jewish uh, girls' school. And uh, 
I never changed school because afterwards I was lucky that I started in the Jewish school because I had uh, a room there. Otherwise, uh, Jewish children were not allowed to go to school, and uh, or they were they didn't need to school. They, they, we didn't know that that meant that uh, anyway they're going to kill us. So why should they, we take off space from the school? But uh, we didn't know that. We just felt that that was a, an unfair ruling, but uh, it was part of the everyday life that everybody went along. It's, uh, it was slowly but surely. It came gradually, and, uh, and uh, by the time people uh, realized, they had, a, they had a noddle over their neck, you know. It wasn't Maybe in the beginning it was possible to do things, but I don't know. So what was the most, um, like, what was the happiest memory you have of your early childhood in school? In school, uh, as I said, I, I worked in, uh, I mean, I, I went to Jewish day school, and uh, uh, this was still Romania, which was before 1940. Uh, even so, the Romanians were much less in the process of uh, uh, following uh, Hitler's uh, example. Uh, they were very eager to catch the school of any uh, Thing that they could, so that they should call, close that school uh, if it's not up to par. So we had these inspectors who came and uh, periodically checked what do we know, and they were very unfair because they asked questions that uh, that no child in second or third grade would know, and uh, and. Uh, Possibly, who is the head of the Catholic Church? Well, this is a Jewish day school. How many children of 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 eight or nine know who is the who is the head of Catholic Church? Not that many, right? So this is a kind of questions they did, which meant that they wanted to disqualify, or they they are not up to curriculum. We should close this school. And uh, I had a. I was ill and I wasn't in class. And uh, each time when the, this uh, uh, su the supervisors came, uh, the, the school principal came with him. And uh, uh, whatever was the question, I don't know because I wasn't there. But uh, the principal said, Citrum. And, uh, one of the girls stood up and said, Citrum is not here today. And he said, well, if Citrum is not here, the whole class is not here. Because I usually answered all those uh, questions because uh, I used to read for my grandfather, so I was ahead in certain ways I have the head. So I think that that was the high, uh, High point. So my my girlfriend, you know, came by in the afternoon and and uh, told me that uh, this is what the uh, uh, principal Biro, his name was Biro, uh, said, and I think that made me very important. How good a student were you, really? What? How good a student were you? Well, let's put it this way. In the, st in the school where I went, if you had all A's in the majors, then you would get A in the minors. If it wasn't, if you didn't misbehave or something, but you didn't have a, a, a artistic band to do beautiful pictures, uh, they did not penalize you then. If you tried your best, but well, uh, I wasn't good in the minors, but I always had all A's. So I think that uh, I was okay. 
Did you get the A's because you studied a lot? No, because I knew a lot. I, I only studied very little. I, I, I had a kind of a photographic memory at that point. I, uh, I remember one year I, uh, uh, I got a fail on, a, on an exam on a term paper. Term papers were though that uh, everything that we did on th that semester was uh, part of it, and each person got a different subject, a different portion. So you couldn't follow, you couldn't copy from the next one. Or, uh, and uh, and I started crying, and I said, "How can you say that I failed? I, I can't fail." And uh, and she said, "Well, you used even the punctuation and and the." Uh, new chapter and everything else, just like in the book. So you had to copy. And I said, no, I was studying that morning in the park. And that used to be the thing that I did. And, and, and I said, so I memorized it. So she said, but nobody can memorize it that well. So she said, go to the principal. So I went to the principal's office and she gave me a book which I really didn't understand at all. But she said, Memorize this page, and I memorized that page. But I read it, and 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 I could. I didn't know what it was about, but it was. I could recite it. So, I got an A. It's okay. But that that was one of the things that I failed. What did you do after school? I didn't have much time after school. After school, I also went to. Uh, I forgot to tell you that, but I also went to Bed Jacob. Uh, Bet Yaakov. That was for uh, religious girls who didn't go to school for some reason, you know, but because the school wasn't religious enough. So it was a, a school, two hours, I think twice a week, uh, in the school with a different teacher, with a teacher who was uh, very religious. Uh, and, and wore a wig and, uh, you know, our teachers did not wear wigs or anything like that. Uh, so my mother insisted that I go there too. I haven't the faintest idea why. Uh, I never figured out why, but I did that too. I learned a lot. I, I, I know a lot. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's things that, uh, that only boys uh, are taught uh, according to our religion. Uh, I learned there because uh, this was, some things were original, but basically mainly it was that you have some kind of a grounding in, in, uh, in uh, the halakha, in the uh, Jewish uh, religion and, and the customs and, and uh, to be a good orthodox wife someplace eventually, I don't know. But uh, I did that too. So after, after school I, I had to go to one lesson, to the other lesson, to the third lesson, whatever, whichever lesson it was. I mean, you know, since I went to each one, uh, that took quite some time. It wasn't like the teacher came and the next half hour I have another one and another one, so I didn't do that. And uh, so most of my afternoons I was busy uh, going after my lessons or a bed Jacob or uh, doing uh, whatever homework I had to do. How did some of your friends fit into this routine? Uh, not that well. I had a lot of girlfriends. I used to, uh, sometimes I would uh, have like a half an hour in between two teachers and they they lived in that area, so I would go and, and, and play with them or, or, or uh, many times I would help with their homework uh, if they needed any help. Uh, on uh, Saturday afternoon, usually they came to me, or, or uh, we, we didn't do any strenuous physical things. 
on Saturday. But uh, uh, during the week, I didn't have that much time to play with anybody. Did you have a favorite sport? Uh, swimming. How often did you swim? Only in the summer. <laughs> it's only in the summer and only, uh, well, since, uh, since my grandmother, I was my grandmother's favorite grandchild, I think. But every summer she would go for three weeks to Hurort, it's called, you know, where the waters come out hot and then uh, they get, uh, they think that they get better. I'm not sure of that. Uh, but I was, I was accompanying her, you know, most, most, most things. And, and then for the three weeks where she would go to, I would go to the regular swimming pool and, 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 and swim. And we had uh, two uh, uh, places uh, near our city, you know, just like a, almost like a suburb in this country, where uh, you could go and they had the, the waves, they had the machine to do the waves, and I learned how to, to, to jump around the waves, and then one summer I went to the sea, uh, the Black Sea, and, uh, and uh, uh, swam in the Black Sea and all that, but uh, uh, it's not that uh, you had, you only had uh, uh, we had a municipal swimming pool, and uh, uh, I remember that my mother let me go by myself. I was fairly young, and I, I even took my brother, who was even younger, and uh, we went to the municipal swimming pool in the summer when it was hot. And uh, But I don't think that you had that much occasion to swim, and, and you didn't have in the winter or fall. Which grandparent did you go to, uh, to the spa? Uh, with my grandmother, mother, maternal grandmother. I didn't have, any, I didn't have any paternal gra uh, grandparents at, uh, at any time. Uh, only when I was very little, my, gra my paternal grandmother lived, but I don't really remember. We'll pick this up in a few minutes. Tell me about your relationship to your brother when you were little. Well, I really loved him. I really loved him. I I was always reprimanded that I I am uh, moving my my teeth together because. I, I lost him so much that I, I, I did that. And my mother always said, you're gonna lose your teeth. Uh, and when I started to learn how to do this and how to do that, I, I, had to te I wanted to teach him also, you know, that he, he should know how to read, he should know how to write. <laughs> Even so, he wasn't ready. But then finally, when he was ready, I, I, I always helped him and, and, and uh, and we, 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 we never fought, actually. And uh, we are still good friends. What's the difference in your age? Uh, about three years. Did you take him many places with you? Uh, I used to take him into town. If I went, uh, like it was uh, my mother's birthday or my father's birthday or, or wedding anniversary or something. Uh, the two little Citrum children went to town and got a present. But, uh, you know, we, we always got the present together. And uh, I don't really remember where we got the money, but, <laughs> but we always got the present together. So I always took him and I took him to the swimming pool in the summer and took him ice skating in the winter, and uh, because I was a brick sister, you know. And uh, yeah, I, I, I really loved him. I always loved him, and I still love him. Where did he go to school? He went to the same uh, school except for the boys' school. 
and I have a picture of him in the yard of the school, except uh, I don't have it. I, I couldn't find it uh, when I was looking for new old pictures. Uh, I will I will find it. He went to the Orthodox boys' school. I went to the girls' school. He went to the boys' school. The boys' school was on the uh, on the synagogue yard. I mean, it was ne uh, in in the other side of the synagogue, or the main synagogue of the big synagogue, and uh, he he went there, and as as I did was at the girls' school. He went to the boys' school. He never went to any other school because uh, he couldn't. So until uh, 1940, he was always in the same school. The only difference was that uh, the elementary school was in, on one level and the high school was on the other level. The high school started in fifth grade. You had to pass an exam. If you were able to pass an exam, then you, a fifth, you, you went to first grade gymnasium. If you didn't pass the exam, then you went to sixth grade, uh, fifth and sixth grade elementary school. And then you didn't go to gymnasium. You went to either trade school or uh, some other light of gymnasium, but mostly for people who did well and who hoped to have some kind of an academic future, uh, such as uh, doctors or, or teachers or uh, whatever was open. Uh, later on, there was nothing open, actually. So. When you said that it was the only school your brother could go to, what did you mean by that? Well, because he was a Jewish little boy. So he wouldn't go to any other school. When did that law start? I don't know. There was no, first, uh, uh, six percent, there was the first law was that they can take six percent of population, of, of students Jewish and uh, that wasn't really observed that keenly actually basically but there were some place some places yeah uh, but then it became numerous clauses which means uh, in Latin it means no percent no number of Jews admitted, and uh, so. What year was that, if you I remember? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, if I think back, I remember everything, but I don't remember the years. I think it became kind of a mishmash in my head that, uh, you know, uh, I remember one night uh, my uncle who was traveling and he came, uh, my mother's younger brother, and he came, arrived uh, kind of in the middle of the night, and uh, he was so upset, and he blurted out that they were throwing Jews out of the moving train. Uh, of course, he was, uh, he was a reddish blonde and blue-eyed guy. <laughs> he didn't look Jewish, but people who looked like Jewish and, and but, uh, and, and, and this was in the 30s. It was, I was, a, I was a young child because I remember that I, it was hard for me to digest what I heard. But he, he was so upset and, and, and he arrived like, like in the middle of the night, kind of late, uh, because that's when the train arrived and, 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 and he, he was, uh, he also gave me my first watch, a lady's watch, which I was so proud of. And I was not really ready for that kind of thing, but, uh, but uh, uh, he brought me that. So I remember, I remember it clearly. But he was so upset that he, he, he didn't wait until uh, I am out of, hearing or, or, or what normally would be the case with the children, you know, that, uh, because I think this was the first time in, 
it was still Romania, not Hungary. And uh, uh, we had the Iron Guard, which was a, a small party. And they were going on the train and, and doing that. Uh, I really don't know what year. But I, I know that it's, it's one of my early recollections. Not, uh, And I know that it was Romania. It was definitely, so it had to be in the 30s someplace. But I shouldn't have heard it, but I did. What was your first recollection um, as a young person um, that somehow anti-Semitism was attacking you or influencing you? First grade. You? First grade, uh, first day, I had my best dress on, and everybody had their best dress on because uh, that was before uh, you didn't have uniforms on, in the first grade. And uh, uh, you are coming out of the school, but now you know this is Orthodox Jewish day school, so it's 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 a Jewish school, Jewish children, and uh, this teenagers, mostly kind of teenagers, young, uh, uh, have these rotten tomatoes from the market and pelted us with the rotten tomatoes. And I had to go home on the street with this, uh, and it was early September, so uh, the dress was like summery kind of dress, and with these blotches of red tomatoes that's sticking to my skin. I, I, I can still feel it so many years later. I think that was a rude awakening for a little girl who had, up till then, kind of, up till then, maybe later on too, in a way normal, and I guess normal for the times. Use, you know, childhood and, and use. Did you understand what was happening? Yes. Yes. I understood what was happening. I understood that they don't like me, that they feel that I am dirty, because they said, you dirty Jew. And uh, I didn't know why I was dirty. I took a bath this morning. Uh, I went home. I was crying, and uh, and uh, my mother cleaned me up. and uh, and. Uh, threw away the dress even so it was a bad, it was a new dress but I, I was never given the dress again because uh, so I shouldn't maybe I shouldn't remember or something but uh, but I remember and what were recurring incidences that um, happened how when was the next example for you well, the next example was, uh, as I told you, those uh, uh, visiting uh, uh, inspectors in school who were very unfair to us little girls in school. And, uh, and uh, we were told with, no, with so many words that they are really looking to close up the school. And uh, we felt very protective of our school, and and, and 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 we felt that we shouldn't be closed up. We are as good as anybody else, you know. We we, we learn. We, we we learn. I mean, you know, today, uh, uh, if the children have twenty people in in their class, that's a lot. We had uh, when they threw out all the Jewish children, we had like fifty-two, and we learned much more than they are doing today because believe me if I didn't have a good education I wouldn't be where I am today I can thank all I resented all those lessons and all those uh, times when I had to run from one place to the other place but uh, I am very thankful for my mother that uh, and I guess my father that uh, they insisted that I do those things because uh, I lived after the communists took over. You know, we, we, I lived in many countries 
the every place I went, I, the first day I was at home because I spoke the language. I was never a newly arrived. Of course, by today I speak a language, every language I speak with, a, with an accent. Wherever I go, and they, nobody believes that, oh yeah, that's your mother tongue? No. You, how come you speak with an accent? Can't help it. When was the <coughs> first time you put on a yellow star? Uh, it had to be, uh, they, they arrived uh, in March of 1944. And uh, my brother's so-called bar mitzvah would have been April the 5th or 6th, which is a Shabbat. And, uh, and by that time we had a yellow star. So I can't really tell you. Uh, the thing was that uh, the day that the Germans came, uh, marched in to our city, uh, I was very ill. I was very ill the, the week before I had pneumonia. And uh, I remember that uh, I, 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 I was getting better. I, you know, pneumonia, you have a crisis, and then afterwards you get better, uh, or you hope to be better. And uh, through the door, I saw my uncle, who was the doctor, you know, and, and my, brother, my mother's brother, walk in. And I said, oh, Yoshibachi, am I going to die? Because when somebody was very ill, he would always materialize so that, uh, that uh, you make sure that you get the best uh, care. Uh, anybody in the, hub, in the family, that's, that was part of his. He lived in a different city, so, uh, uh, and, uh, so that was the day when I was a little better, and that's the day that the Germans marched in. Uh, so afterwards, I, it took me some days until I, 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 I recovered a little more. And uh, there was no penicillin or uh, anything at that time, so I got better. What and day was that? What? What was the date? Uh, I think March the 17th, either 17th or 19th. And the year? 1944. And then afterwards, everything went real fast. You know, every day uh, some new laws came, uh, or almost every day, against the Jews. What was your reaction to um, wearing a yellow star? In a way, to a degree, I was, I felt proud because I felt that I am of an ancient people that, that survived all those other cultures, all those other people, and we are still somehow here. On the other hand, I would suppose I felt like black people felt in this country that when you walk on the street, you were, you know, they have a black skin, nothing else. I had a yellow star, which was my black skin, or that was telling people that I am, a, I am free to, to beat, so to, to do anything too, because I have a yellow star. I am no, no longer a person that has to be respected. And I suppose in the South, black people felt the same way. So when I came to the, I never saw black people in Europe, but when I came to the United States, I felt uh, a great empathy to the people who have a,
people who who no fault through no fault of their own, you know, can be discriminated according to the the laws of the land at that point, Wh which is in 1950. Uh, there were still uh, places down south which said that uh, Jews and niggers are not welcome. How did it affect your family? In, in well, I don't really know who lost what, where. Uh, I don't think that that was so much my uh, sphere of knowledge. Uh, I know that that uh, at one point uh, my two uncles, uh, my father was helping my two uncles out. I know that I had an uncle who was a uh, bank manager and he lost his job because, uh, uh, because he was Jewish. And, uh, but I don't know the years and I don't really know exactly, uh, possibly I heard about it much later. Uh, it's not something that was discussed. As I told you that uh, the, the least children know the best it is uh, according to the belief at that point. Uh, so. Uh, so how did your life change? My life did not actually change that much. Uh, the people around me, uh, you know, as I said, uh, the people in, in the shower, you know, in the place where my mother worked, you know, were uh, uh, changed to be all Jewish. Uh, we uh, lost uh, uh, our housekeeper, and, and uh, but the next day we had one. Uh, who, whom I liked too. I, I, I really liked her, so it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it really did not. But what changed in a way, it was that I really didn't have, I was never a teenager, I was never a girl. Actually, you know, it wasn't, uh, you still had, I never had a date or, or any, anything like that because that, that wasn't the time and, and the place. And, and uh, so uh, I suppose that, that, but I didn't know any better. So I didn't miss it. Now I know better when I see my, uh, when I saw my children, my, my child and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. Oh, yeah, that's different. I never had that. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's okay, and I think, uh, in a way, uh, that life prepared me for what was to come, to survive whatever happened, and, uh, and to be able to start in this United States. When was the first real big change for you? When did you know that the world as you knew it was was really going to be uprooted. When I got better from that pneumonia and I went back to school, those were the last days of school actually, but uh, because of the of, of uh, yellow tsar and everything else, we we did not go to school anymore, and uh, and uh, our uh, teachers who were, of course. Only one survived, you know, none of them survived. Uh, I remember that they got up and they consoled us or consoled themselves and they told us, uh, I remember a history teacher who, was a, who came from a very uh, illustrious family and, and uh, her brother was a uh, had a newspaper, it was a local newspaper, he was, a, that was his, and uh, she, ca she came and she said, you know, the trees don't grow to the sky, and eventually this is going to be over, and then we, we shall meet again. We never met again, and uh, 
But she was right that she did not go to the sky. And eventually, those times passed. And uh, I guess we, we, uh, I survived, but she didn't. What was her name? Pastor Magda. When the school closed down, what did you do next? Nothing. Nothing. At that time, it was trying to survive, trying to... to by that time, you, you had the coupons for sugar, for, for flour, for... Uh, uh, you tried to survive, not to go on the street, not to, not to do this, not to do that. Uh, it was... Uh, it was a a kind of life without any planning or, or, or uh, you know, it was just kind of trying to survive, that's all. I have no particular recollection of anything specific. I just know that you had to be afraid and that you had to try to see that tomorrow comes again. What were you feeling about being afraid? What was the feeling of fear? Uh, I shall overcome. That was my feeling. I, I will survive. I will. This, is my, this was my motto in, in, in the camp and this was my motto before. I will, this will pass and I will, I, I will survive. Whatever comes my way, I will survive. When you mentioned that you had a fear, what was the fear of? Well, the fear was, uh, was uh, uh, the rumors were that uh, the Jewish girls from Slovakia were taken to the borders and uh, to the prostitution in, in, for the German soldiers. Uh, the fear was, uh, uh, okay, so she's a girl, she, you know, uh, she might be, she's a little young, but maybe she is, you know, and, and so uh, they were afraid that they're going to take every a night, so I would sleep in, in, in various friends' homes, uh, mostly mixed marriages, uh, and uh, then in the morning would go back to, to to home, in the in the beginning I went to school yet, but uh, only a few days, and then uh, after that there was no school. How long did that feeling last? Forever. That feeling never never, never went away until uh, I think it never went away, because. Uh, uh, after we were liberated, and we figured that we were liberated, so my my father and my brother probably got. We hoped we didn't know uh, what what was happening actually, but if we got liberated, they got liberated, or maybe they got liberated, and uh, so we went back. Uh, we hopped the train here, a tra train there, and, and we went back to uh, my birthplace. And uh, uh, that was 10 women. We, we got together and, uh, you know, at various train stations. And somehow we got 10, 10 women from the same city, and we were going home. And we got home, okay? We, we called it home. We were born there. and. Uh, uh, the next day, they put a big white sign on the railroad station. Next time, we are not deporting, we are hanging. So, I could not feel that I survived, because I figured that next time I'm going to get hanged, not deported. So I can't survive that. So the fear never left me until I came to the United States.
the f when I came to the United States, I had a baby carriage, and I was pushing the baby carriage. And the policeman said, good morning, ma'am. Uh, can I, I had a European carriage, which uh, is not very good for our high uh, sidewalks. And uh, uh, it was difficult to get from one side of the street to the other side with that carriage. And uh, the policeman asked if he can help me. And I saw him, and I said, this is it. Now I can feel at home, and I can feel I don't have to be afraid. He, 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 he wanted to, he helped me. He was a policeman. So I'm okay. When things, um, war really moved in um, and surrounded you to such a degree, what happened to your family? Where did you go? No place. We couldn't go any place. No place. We just tried to live from day to day. It's, uh, they established a place where they took all the Jewish guys who had uh, a lot or a little or nothing to press it out from them if they hid anything in the ground or in near or where, whatever it is, they, they kept them and uh, they uh, tortured them and everything else. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, so it, it, it really was something that you just wanted to survive. And if you were a child, you were a young person, then you had the optimism that you can survive. Uh, if you were a little older, then people gave up that you can't, this is not something that you can survive. And uh, they didn't, well, they did. We'll pick up in a minute. Thank you. Tell me how your living circumstances changed for the first time. Well, uh, uh, because our place fell into the ghetto, it was actually the wall was in front of our home. So that was the end of the ghetto. But we fell in the ghetto. And uh, so all the families, uh, all the the members of the family who did not fall in the ghetto, they all came to live with us. Uh, so they, they took out all the furniture from the apartment, from the house, and they took out everything. And then they left the mattress. Who was they? Uh, I really don't know. They just came and took. Uh, who was in charge? I don't know. I just know that Were they there men or women? Uh, men. 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 They came with, uh, with carts and, and they took everybody's belongings and, and uh, whatever they could because... Uh, and uh, they also brought a couple extra mattresses and, and, uh, and then everybody was sleeping on the floor, one next to the other one, so each family was kind of Children and parents slept together uh, in one corner, and the next next to them is another family. And what was your parents' reaction to this? Well, my mother couldn't stand it, so she fell ill, and she was lying on on the floor there, on her side of the mattress, uh, most of the time while we were in a ghetto. And uh, how old were you then? What? How old were you then? Uh, I was 16. I was 16. Uh, it's... Uh, my father dealt with it better, and he did all the arrangements so that he kind of made sure that all his cousins and, uh, and, and all, all these people who came to live with us, uh, uh, had a spot space. Uh, he helped me 
a kind of dole out a little bit of the food that we had uh, so that we, can, we could provide a little bit more than uh, what uh, the central agency gave for all these people, which was a piece of bread and some, some kind of a soup, for the, you know, which was not very good. And, uh, uh, but then my father was taken to this uh, torture place because, uh, and uh, I don't think he was ever the same after that. Where did he go? He didn't go. They took him. Nobody what? went. Everybody was taken by force. Nobody went. Where was he but taken? But you followed, you followed, which was uh, uh, basically because the propaganda is very good, you know, and, and people felt that they can survive it. I think maybe if they knew what was coming, they wouldn't have gone that fast, that, like sheep, you know. But... Uh, Do you recall the name of the uh, place where he went? Yeah. It was. Uh, it usually. It used to be the beer factory, and that's where they took all those people. All these people. Uh, and then they released him after some time. How did he come back? What? How did he come back? In what state? Not good. He put up a good face. But he went to bed right away, and uh, I don't know. I felt very guilty. Uh, Why? I don't know because I I should have prevented it. I don't know. I I, I always felt guilty. Not that I was guilty, but I, I always felt guilty. To this day, I always felt guilty feel guilty about that. And uh, the ghetto life, it was, uh, uh, well, if you, if you figure out that, that uh, 33,000 people they put into, I don't know how many square meters, uh, it's, uh, it was a very uh, crowded, uh, terrible thing, and uh, it wasn't, uh, for the average people, uh, it, uh, you, could, you could walk, uh, there was a curfew, but other than that, during the day, I could walk to my aunt, which also fell into the ghetto, so she had the other end of the family, uh, but she had a smaller, she only had one child, and they had a smaller he lost also the jo his job because of the Jewish laws very early. So they lived in a small apartment. So she didn't have much room for uh, people to come in there. Uh, but I could walk there and see to it that uh, how are they or whatever have you. How was she related to you? Uh, my uncle was my, brother, my father's brother. And... Uh, uh, Agi, who was my cousin, they had only one daughter. She was a little bit younger th between my brother and myself. And uh, I used to tutor her. So she wasn't, she was very pretty. Beautiful figure. But she started to have a beautiful figure and, and very beautiful face. But not very beautiful brains. Uh, she, she was okay, but uh, so as she started gymnasium, you know, it, 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 she needed tutoring, and I said, okay, I do it. And uh, in between classes or whatever I had to do, I went to their apartment and tutored her too. So I was very close to her, and uh, I felt very protective of her. Uh, she got killed the first day. The first day of what? of when she arrived in Auschwitz. How do you know? Well, you know, something, uh, I, uh, it was a, 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 a city 
but certain people knew each other, and uh, this uh, transports went every day. And the people from my city, uh, we went one day, they went another day. But the area where they came from, I knew other people who, who, uh, who got into the camp. And, and they told, the, you know, we told them who did not get in the camp and he got killed on the first day. And they told us who, who went to the left and who, and we, by that time we knew that whoever went to the left was condemned to die that day. Uh, How did you find that out? Uh, when we got to Auschwitz, they said, form, they chased us, they, they, they opened the, the train, and uh, it was cattle, cattle wagons, and they opened the big doors and jumped down. And uh, uh, after four days of that cattle, it, it was, uh, we were kind of glad that we could jump down, uh, except that as we, it, they were these uh, inmates. We, we saw that they had the striped uh, uh, clothing and uh, uh, men's, uh, men, old men, or younger, not, not, not old, but uh, uh, men, nevertheless. And they, uh, under their breath, kind of, they said, give the children to the old ones, to the old ones. If they saw something, you know, it was very, very because it was like Marty, uh, because of the ghetto, uh, so your mother moved into you, you know, or, or, or you moved to the mother, whoever it was, but basically the families came together. And uh, so uh, they were not allowed to warn us, warn us but, but they did in Yiddish, which Hungarian Jews don't really speak. Not, not that much, only the kind of old-fashioned people, but the city people did not. My mother would never do that. And, uh, but anyway, they, 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 some people he heeded whatever they said, and they, uh, uh, so the younger people got into the camp. Uh, that doesn't mean that they survived. This was the first day of many days. But uh, people who had children or people who, uh, like the, I, saw, I showed you my cousin who was 23, 24, I don't really know exactly, uh, went with her mother. Why did she go with her mother? Because she felt that she wanted to be with the mother, you know. I didn't know that that means that she's going to get killed. Uh, Before we get to um, your experience in Auschwitz completely, could you describe how you got there from the ghetto and how long were you in the ghetto? We were in the ghetto until the beginning of June sometimes and uh, uh, whatever it was, every day there was a transport, and uh, uh, the day before they told you that the next day is your transport, and uh, they opened a gate of the ghetto at one point because they had this uh, this uh, 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 they surrounded the ghetto with uh, with some kind of a uh, wall and. Uh, so they opened it at one point, and they took us to the park, which had a, a side uh, uh, railroad uh, tracks. And uh, so we marched to that place from the ghetto. They took us. Nobody went. We all went. But I couldn't characterize it as we went. We were told to do that, and we were on no uncertain terms. Did you know where you were going? No. No. Absolutely not. They said we are going to work 
someplace in uh, the other side of the Danube. And uh, I don't really understand how smart people would believe that when they take the children and they take the old people, what kind of a work is that? I mean, before they took people for forced labor, uh, young men to, for forced labor who could do that. So they were on forced labor and they did go to forced labor. So maybe they can take forced labor for young women, young men, but they can't take real old people, and they can't take two, two months old babies or whatever it is. That only hinders, it does not help. So if they took families as it is, they should have, I think the grown-ups should have understand, understood it. But what did you understand of it when nothing, you... Nothing. We understood that we were being taken to some kind of a work camp someplace on the other side of the Danube. That was... Tell me about being in the, in the, in the transport, in the cattle car. Well, the cattle what? car was a terrible thing, 75 people in, in one cattle car. And uh, my uncle, the, my older uncle, who was, uh, I, I, I mentioned it, that he was the oldest brother, and his wife got some kind of uh, poison from my, from their, from his cousin, who was a doctor. He was also in that cattle car because he was also in in our uh, ghetto uh, apartment. And uh, they took the poison and they died. And we asked the Hungarian gendarmes to take them off because they are dead. And they said, oh no, we get two marks for every Jew. If they wanted to be so, with the 75 people in this cattle car, we had two dead people who were trying to, uh, starting to, it's, it's been it's summertime, it's 75 people. He st the, those dead people try, uh, start to disintegrate because they do that the first the first night, because they didn't know where we were going, how long they have, and they they understood that uh, they were not that young, and and maybe they understood that they can survive, whatever it is, I don't know, but I know that they committed suicide, and we had the four days with two dead people among the 75. So we, we really had a terrible, 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 and also they took more space in, in, in you know, lying down. Uh, but you only had room to, to, to sit there, have faith. So uh, well, finally, after the four days, we got to Auschwitz. What then, did you use for food on the train? Uh, no food. They did not give us food. Uh, we brought some food with us. Uh, I don't think anybody was hungry, basically. Or maybe they were, I don't know. We had a slop bucket and we had a water bucket. And that's what they gave us. And whenever the stain stopped, uh, they allowed the slop bucket to be taken down and, and uh, by a man from the train and uh, get rid of it and uh, get uh, fresh water. But for the 75 people, we had one slab bucket and one, one water bucket. Uh, so that's what the, it was a, a, a ride that I don't think anybody would forget. And when you arrived there at the train, station in Auschwitz. They started hollering at us, Raus, Raus, which means out, out, and uh, line up with five, at, at five in a row, women separate, men separate. And, uh, and then all these 
Jewish guys who were the Donder Commando, it was called. That was their job, and every six months they got killed. And the new one was because, uh, so they should not bear witness of whatever they saw. But they did all the dirty work. And they did the dirty work because they wanted to survive against their mothers, their fathers, or whatever, whoever it was. Originally, it was them who arrived there. And, and, uh, and uh, so they were very bitter people. And they knew that eventually they, uh, they don't survive because they, they get killed. Except they hoped that the war, because the war by that time, it was winding down, really. And everybody hoped that, against hope, that uh, you will be, uh, be freed. You know, you, 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 freedom is coming. Where was your, your father and brother? In the well, uh, as, as we got down, my brother, my, my brother was a little boy. And usually little boys did not survive. The thing was that that winter, he, uh, and they told us to take winter clothes because we're going to be in that place wherever we are going. I don't know what we took with winter clothes because they took everything away from us, uh, even the things that we were on, uh, on our bodies. And um, they, uh, my brother, that winter, he grew quite a bit. And his winter coat did not fit. Uh, he didn't get his, his growth period yet because he was 13, but he just started. Unfortunately, that was uh, bad because after that he didn't have to eat, so it, uh, you know, didn't never got there wherever he would get normally. But either way, uh, one of my father's brother was short. Basically, they were not short people, but this one brother was short. And he said, oh, well, I have two, two coats. And actually, I brought it into the ghetto with me, both of them. So my brother wore this, this coat, which was down to here. And, and uh, uh, instead of short pants, uh, this uncle also gave him a pair of pants, which did not fit him at all, but uh, but either way, he looked like a short little guy, like like you know some some people were a little short, you know, and because he was all dressed like that, so uh, uh, and my he wanted to come with my mother and me, and and my mother said to him, why don't you go with daddy? It's uh, he's going to be by himself, and I have uh, Ruji, which is my name, and. Uh, so I won't be alone, and, and he shouldn't be alone. So my brother went with my father, next to my father, and he got into the camp as a, as a short little guy. Uh, afterwards, when the next uh, selection was, uh, he was selected and he was taken away from my father's, you know, because they realized that he was, and then he was taken to another, he was actually, my brother had this big distinction that he was selected twice and he was already in the gas chamber. And what happened, it was a big selection and there were too many people. And they felt that they're not going to die well if it's overcrowded. And uh, a, a German uh, major, uh, whose name I don't know, said, whoever can be do 20 push-ups, the, tw the first 20 people can go back. And my, mother, my brother was very agile, and he did the 20 push-ups, and he went back. He was, consequently, he was selected again, but for, for some reason, he, he was put into a, a, a b barrack, with other people that the, the next morning they would take them to the gas chamber. And, uh, and uh, he was the only child, and the other ones were all men. And they said, you know what? One stood on the top of the other one, and they pushed the, him 
out through that, and he was really skinny and, and uh, you know, small bone with a kid. Uh, up on top there were those, ho those windows or holes, whatever it is, uh, for air. And they pushed him out there, and then he jumped down, and he melted into the uh, rest of the thing. And uh, after that, uh, for some reason, they, uh, they took him to take care of the, of the horses. And this is how he survived. And then he was on the march to bergen and, and, and that's where he was uh, liberated. Let's get back to what happened to you in Auschwitz and how long you were there. We were there uh, most of that summer. Uh, I don't remember. One day was like the other day, and was just one was worse than the other day. And uh, uh, the Germans were very good at putting a lot of salt in our little soup, and then uh, doing blocksperre. Blocksperre means that you can't go out, you can't go to the bathroom, and you can't go to have a, a drink of water. Uh, there is no water in the block and you can't go to the bathroom, so you die of thirst. So you don't die of thirst, but you are very uncomfortable. Believe me, it's very uncomfortable. So this was one of their good tricks to, to make us even less comfortable. Or, and, and comfortable we were not, really not. Uh, the other one was that uh, they made us stand in the sun you know, all day long. People would die, would, would faint uh, out of the line, you know, at lines of five, stand there. You really can't move, you can't do anything. I mean, you know, maybe you could scratch this much, but that's, that was about the length of it. You can't uh, go to the bathroom or anything like that because God forbid, I mean, you know. What happens if you had to go? Did you go? But then you don't, you didn't. You didn't. Or what? or whatever you did. It's, there was no way of, 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 of going. That how, wasn't allowed. How did your mom survive this? Uh, my mom, the first uh, four or five days, was actually, uh, she had some high fever, actually, when you, when you touched her, she, but she had fever. You, and, and she was talking nonsense. And, uh, and then she came out of it somehow. Uh, we were together with uh, three of my cousins, uh, my father's nieces, who, uh, see my mother's uh, family was not from Radio or Nagyvarod, uh, and none of them ever lived there. So I just, uh, Basically, in the in, in like the ghetto, I only we only had my father's family, which was very extensive, very extensive, and uh, uh, so three of my father's nieces, my father's sisters' uh, daughters came with us in the in, actually only one survived. The other two was were <laughs> shot the last day before the march. How did that happen? Uh, one had uh, a fever, and he was, uh, she was, uh, she, she was uh, considered that she can't go on the march. And the sister, who was okay, said, I stay with her. And uh, Anybody who was there who could not march was shot right there in the camp, right there and left there. And, uh, and uh, then we marched for 10 days around, kind of, almost around, because finally we, 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 we were here before. You know, we, we, we realized that we, we just didn't have where to march. When did this march... Uh in January of 45, when the Russians were nearby. 
actually we uh, as we marched we were sometimes in the uh, on the side of the street on the, on the road and uh, we could see them up there having uh, a fight and coming with the tanks and, and, and doing this and that and actually by that time the Germans did not have much a power, but they were much better soldiers than the Russians. The Russians only fought if uh, sometimes uh, the cart to the food did not arrive after the troops. We saw that. But if they had to go in the battle, the vodka always arrived. It was in a in a in a in a cart, you know, like a like a milk uh, tank, you know, and then they all were, and this even even at that time I was very young and, and, and very inexperienced, but I couldn't understand. These Russian soldiers came through western part of Russia, which was occupied by the Germans. They saw what they did to their people. They did. They saw how they devastated. Uh, they did all kinds of atrocities. It, it's uh, you know, and uh, and uh, they need vodka to fight. Couldn't understand. I really, I, 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 I don't think I even understand it today, with my old head. And at that time, I really didn't. How long did you stay in Auschwitz before you? Were, um, we were went on the march. We were that we had selections almost daily, and every time they took some people away. And and by the time uh, we were selected, finally, my mother, uh, you know, the uh, selection was naked, of course, and your body showed that you didn't have what to eat, and 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 uh, if you were young maybe it was half okay but if you were uh, late 30s or something uh, some some of those the women who managed to look young and uh, you know uh, working uh, work able uh, were in their 40s maybe even 50 um, I don't know but uh, then uh, all these selections they finally they picked them you know and you could see that they are older. They, you know, the bodies did not lie. You couldn't do anything about that. And my mother at that point really looked bad. So uh, we did this that, that we had uh, one girl who was really a young girl, 29 or 30, but she looked like, she looked like, like 80 or so, you know, her body, for some reason it, it deteriorated so badly. So we put her in uh, front, and we put put my mother after her. We'll pick up it in a minute. Thank you. Camera one. Tell me how long you were in Auschwitz. We were in Auschwitz uh, during the summer. But June, July, and a little part of August. Then uh, where did you go? I, I know that we were in Auschwitz when uh, uh, the ghetto of Lublin was brought in. We, we saw them brought in. That was the last uh, transport that came in. Uh, and... Uh, after that, shortly thereafter, we were selected and we went to, uh, we were taken to Stutthof and, uh, and then from Stutthof to work camp. Why do you think you were selected to go to Stutthof? I don't really know. I don't know. Um, most, uh, most things that, that they, the Germans did at that point uh, sometimes uh, deny uh, uh, proper thinking. 
uh, this was the primary uh, thing was to eliminate the Jewish race. They were losing the, the war. At that point in 1944 summer, they were losing the war. Uh, as a matter of fact, Romania jumped out and, and uh, they were no longer in Romania. Uh, I, I know that uh, that was sometimes in August and I know that I was already in the work camp. So this is why I don't really know dates because we didn't have a calendar and we didn't have dates. We just were looking for survival. How much did you know of what was going on with the war? Uh, not much except uh, that uh, uh, at one point we were working for the Wehrmacht. We were uh, 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 Heftlinge or uh, prisoners of the SS, but we were working for the Wehrmacht and the Wehrmacht I think paid for the SS something for our work. The Wehrmacht uh, uh, major who was in charge of, of our group uh, because we were, he, they were, uh, they, they were, we had to assess as guarding guards, but we had the Wehrmacht uh, people who were no, uh, giving guards the instructions of what to do and how to do it and, and uh, checked what we did and if we did it right. And uh, this uh, uh, major who was, the chief of our area. Uh, one day he walked by and he looks at me and he says, how old are you? And I, I figured if I tell him how old I am, maybe he gonna think that I'm too young and, 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 and gonna send me to death. Or if I, if I don't tell him how old I am, then maybe, you know, there's no papers, there were no papers, nobody had a paper or anything like that. So, you know, you could say anything. But I really couldn't, couldn't figure what to answer him. And I said, uh, why would you ask me that? And uh, he said, because I have a daughter. I think she's about the same age as you are. And actually she was. Uh, she was a professor in Ulm, uh, in civilian life, he was not a Nazi. He always told me that he has a, uh, uh, in the end, he has a uh, one, uh, uh, one, one he has for himself to kill himself because what is going on, it's not right. And he would tell me, uh, what is going on? He would. He told me that Romania jumped out. Wouldn't, wouldn't you be happy now that if you would be home? And I said yes, I would be happy any place if I would be home and not here. But uh, I am here. And what did you make in this factory? We weren't in a factory. No, we we did uh, uh, tank uh, 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 things that that we we we. we, we dug out a big hole in the earth and then we covered it up and that was that if the tanks would go, uh, the, the Russian tank would go over, would fall and couldn't get up. Uh, and we also did uh, uh, for, for shooting, you know, all kinds of uh, trenches for shooting. We, we lined it with wood beautifully wood, very beautifully lined, very sick, but nobody ever used it. And I don't know what the, Pol Pol uh, the Polish people did afterwards with it. It was in Poland. But uh, the Germans never used it because they were running from the Russians at that point. This was outside um, Stutthof, was it but not? The trenches that you built. Out, outside in, in, in next to the forest and in, the, in, 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 in the fields and, and uh, they had some kind of a pro, uh, some kind of a program they had a, a map and, and, and we followed it whatever the Wehrmacht uh, uh, they, they gave us so many feet that every day to do and, uh, and if you didn't do it and then the SS beat you up are you sure so you, you did it and uh, where was your mother? 
Africa? My, well, my good fortune was that this uh, nice professor also brought me, uh, gave me a tomato, gave me an apple, gave me uh, something. And I would go to the doctor, the, the uh, camp doctor, but also a, she, was a, she was a German, uh, she was also a, a prisoner, but she had all the privileges. And uh, uh, I would give it to her, and she would give a three-day shonung, it's called shonung, for my mother. What is but that? For it, that was that she, she had to stay in camp and uh, she couldn't go to work because she was ill. And uh, uh, so uh, I was able to keep her out of, out of the work uh, detail from uh, October, November, December, uh, January, part of October, November, December, January, part of January before we marched. Uh, so this is how she survived. So this was consistent day after day and week after week that your mother was protected? Well, somehow or the other, yes. It was, uh, I also, uh, after work, when we went back to camp, uh, we had about 20 women dying every day. Not mishandling, it's just from hunger, from cold, from various, uh, a typhoid was at one point uh, rampant in the camp, uh, and uh, somebody had to bury them. So there was a, a burial squad, and I went to the burial squad, even so I was so young and everything else, because I, I got, uh, the burial squad got a, a bowl of soup. But this was the soup that was the end of the kettle. So it had vegetables in it. It wasn't that soup that you all usually got, you know. And so I, I shared that with my mother. So that she, she somehow survived. And I am really very thankful uh, to, to fate that I could do that and I could I was there, and, and that's why I never feel that I shouldn't have been there or, or uh, you know, because I feel that I was there to, to, to make her survive. She survived her late. She was 87, so I feel, I feel very thankful to fate. In January, um when you finished the work in the labor camp, what happened after that? Well, one day they said, today we are not going to work, and lined us up and they said, we are leaving. Take everything that you can. We didn't have anything, but we all had a, a, a blanket. We did have a blanket. And uh, we, uh, wrapped the blanket around and, and uh, tried to put the extra rags on the, on the shoes so that uh, you don't evoke, because at th by that time everything was snow, full of snow, it was. And for 10 days, uh, and then they marched us out of the camp and that was it. Uh, and for 10 days they forgot to give us food or anything, and we ate uh, snow from the side uh, of the road, you know the snow, but the, so I guess you can live 10 days with snow. The hunger hurts. I, I don't know if people know that hunger really is a terrible pain in your stomach and your insides, it eats you. And, uh, and after 10 days, they marched us on into a prison, the prison of Krona, uh, was a massive, the stone structure, or, uh, and uh, there were no prisoners there. We were the prisoners. And they, they locked us up, and I think all the SS disappeared. And the next morning, uh, somebody opened the door, 
and they spoke Russian. And we figured, well, we are liberated, it's something. Actually, we were not liberated. It's, uh, the Russians never gave us a piece of bread or a su a, 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 an ounce of soup or something to eat, to drink, to uh, nothing. To, to organize that we can get out of there or what we can do, nothing. They really were looking, who looks good enough to rape? That's all they were looking for. They, they were not really responsible. I am sorry to say that, but this, this I can testify to that the Russian army was not a liberator army. It was a liberator army since they didn't cook, we kill us anymore, so I guess maybe I should be thankful. Uh, at that point I couldn't be thankful because I had to be more afraid than I was afraid yesterday. Because if I didn't lag behind the troop, then they didn't bother us. They just shot us if you were a little bit behind. But if you kept up, then you could survive. But with this new situation, we really didn't know that we can survive or not. I mean, uh, uh, people would uh, liberate all these uh, skeletons. We were skeletons at po that point, and, uh, and don't give them any food. So we went to the street and we, we begged people a piece of bread. Didn't know any Polish, but that doesn't mean that because real fast we learned how to say, please give us a piece of bread. <laughs> and uh, and then... Uh, how was your mother affected by the um, the Russians coming in she, with their... With she, what? She, at that point, I think she was okay. I didn't. I don't think that she, uh, by by going through all that and and the ten days of marching, and uh, uh, it was that I had a friend who, uh, a, a, a girl about twenty five, who was a big, strong girl, and she had a a rough upbringing, not uh, not one of those lady ladies, and uh, so she she came through pretty good the camp and uh, she helped me kind of carry my, halfway carry my mother, you know. And uh, I, on one side, I, she on the other side. And uh, she took more weight than I could, actually. And this is the way the 10 days she survived. Did you survive the Russians? Yes, I survived the Russians. We, we went to town and we, we uh, uh, occupied, <laughs> we, uh, we went to town and, and uh, the Polish, uh, to the Polish uh, people, and they didn't know what to do with us, but uh, there was a German uh, officer's, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a club or a, a, a place where, where the German officers uh, came for rest. Uh, uh, and uh, they said we can occupy that, so we occupied that. So this is the first time I slept in a in a bed. I had a bed, and uh, uh, and we uh, we, uh, we we begged, bar uh, we, and and we found out how to go from one town to the other town. Hop a train here, hop a train there. And and uh, and make it. Uh, uh, we always wanted to go home. We didn't realize that we don't really have a home, home, but we wanted to go home. You know. What was the le before you got on the um, march, the the way back home? What was the last town where this German club was that you stayed in? Uh, uh, that was in 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 Toruni. Uh, on, or Torn, uh, Torn, I think it's what's called Torn in German. Uh, that that was the place where we we occupied this German, a whole a place. 
it was for the German officers to uh, recoup from the front and stuff, you know. They, uh, and uh, it had little, not big rooms, but two beds in each room, and, and, and it was clean, and it was bad, <laughs> and it had a pillow. And I can't tell you what that meant. After, after all this time, like, like uh, it, it, it meant like you were reborn, kind of. After that, all this uh, hopping and all this, uh, all this railroad stations and everything else, where all the Russian soldiers were, it was very dangerous. It wasn't uh, safe for women to do that. Uh, but uh, how did you avoid being involved with a Russian? Well. <laughs> Once uh, a Russian was bothering me and I kicked him in the genitals. And then afterwards he brought the whole uh, crew of them to find me and, and kill me. And uh, what they did was uh, they stretched me out on the bench, wrapped me in a couple of blankets so that I almost suffocated, and all these skeletons sat on me. Uh, the worse they looked, the better, you know. My mother and, and, and a couple others who, who really looked terrible. And uh, th it was already on, on our way home, so these were the people from my city. And, uh, and of course, they, they wouldn't let uh, the child uh, get uh, in trouble. So, uh, and uh, they, were, they were cursing, they were doing everything under the sun, but, uh, but, but, uh, Finally, they, they had to go back or whatever it is, and, and they got off of me. Uh, this was uh, very close to actually the Hungarian border already. I think it was Czechoslovakia, or, or at that point it was Slovakia, or, or Czech. I don't remember. We, we, didn't, we didn't have passports, we didn't have any papers, so it, 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 we just went. What did you find when you got home? Uh, well, uh, actually, one of my father's brothers, who had a bakery, in uh, a, a big bakery, actually in uh, our city, uh, his bakery was supplying. I mean, they took away from him the bakery, of course, and he was in the ghetto. But uh, his bakery was one of the suppliers of the ghetto. Uh, there were two bakeries, two big bakeries in the city who supplied all these people with, with bread, some kind of a bread. Not very good, but bread. And, uh, uh, what, and, and his driver, you know, was bringing the bread. And one day he, he was at, at the center where there was this, uh, the bread was coming because uh, uh, somebody went always to the center to bring for the house. And it was his turn, so he was there, and he saw this driver who worked for, used to work for him. And somehow or other, I, I, it, he agreed with, with him that the next day he going to bring him uh, some clothes for a driver, for a, a low-class driver, you know. And uh, this was not a, a, a driver for a car or a truck. This was a driver for horses, you know. We didn't, they didn't have trucks. And uh, he was going to sit, like the, like, like the two of them came. Uh, my uncle had blue eyes and, and blonde hair anyway, he didn't look like Jewish at all. And uh, uh, so the next day he did bring some clothes, and my, uh, my uncle was there and then changed real fast in the bathroom. and. And, and sat in the, on, on the and, 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 and was driving the horses. Uh, the two of them sat, you know, there were two of them. And uh, because uh, uh, this driver came to the bed ghetto every day before, so they just let them go out. And then uh, my uncle uh, went to the peasants that uh, I, my father, wanted to 
get me into the Romania. So my uncle went there and, and the peasant uh, took him over to Romania. And in Romania, my, uh, my mother had three brothers who, who lived there and uh, who were not deported or anything. And so my uncle, uh, my father's brother went to my mother's brothers and, and, and survived there. And then when Romania jumped out, which was in 1944, August, he went back to my city and opened up the bakery again. And, uh, and he was there. So when we arrived uh, uh, in the, when we arrived finally to our town, uh, we were asking what is the situation and uh, somebody said, well, you know, we have a Jewish bakery or, or, or they're Jews or whatever. If, I don't remember exactly what they said. So we went to the Jewish bakery. I didn't know that it was my uncle and I didn't know that he survived either. But, uh, and they mentioned, they mentioned uh, the guy who, ha who used to have the other bakery. The, the, you know, I told you that there were two of them. And uh, they said uh, the Steiner is there and, and uh, he opened up a bakery. And uh, so we went to that bakery and lo and behold, my uncle is there. So, uh, oh, he was very nice. He took in all, all these bedraggled girls, and he was a very maniac for, for cleanliness. And then uh, he was, uh, uh, he did not eat meat. He, he was really, a, he stood on his head every day. Uh, for exercise, he was a, 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 a not as a, a, about those things. So I figured that uh, for him it was really a physical pain to see all these dirty women. You know, I mean, we were dirty. We were dirty. Of course, we, we, for the first thing was who is taking the first bath, you know, and everything else. But basically, we, we didn't have clothes or anything. But there was a joint. There was a there was a Jewish. Uh, organization in, in town, and they had some used clothing. And uh, so we went there the, first, the next day and, and, uh, and got some kind of clothing so we could, we could burn all this camp clothes. It was a joint distribution committee, wasn't it? I think so, I think so, but I am not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And the things were given as a as a gift, they collected it in the United States and and then distributed there. It How? was it was uh, it was a wonderful thing because uh, uh, we even got a coat and uh, and some kind of clothes, not not much, uh, but something that was clean, you know. And we we, we did a bonfire and we we burned all those camp things including the number that I used to have. So I really don't know. And I never, I never memorized. I, I, did, I, I refused to memorize it. Because I felt that I, uh, if I memorize it, I'm only a number. I am not a person. I have such crazy ideas. I don't know my social security number either for that reason. That uh, I just want to be a person, not a number. How long did it take you to um, get back into life uh, at Oridia? Well, it did not take, uh, how, it, how about it? It took a long time to get, to hop those trains and from one town to the other town. Uh, sometimes we, we uh, were, uh, we couldn't, uh, we, we, we we waited a couple of days, we waited three days, four days, whatever it was. Uh, some, uh, some towns were more uh, favorable to refugees and, and some places that were in Poland already, some, uh, something for the liberated people. I don't really know who ran that. Uh, 
because uh, like in Lublin there were the parrot's house, which used to be a Jewish uh, uh, institution of some sorts. It, it, it was named after a, a Jewish poet, uh, a Yiddish poet. But uh, then afterwards, I don't know what the Germans did for there, but uh, it was like a center where uh, you could get uh, medical attention and uh, uh, in between the, the doctor, the Russian doctor who was in service there, wanted to cut my big toe because it was frozen. And I said, I, I came into being with ten toes. I gonna go out of here. If I didn't die there, then I can die here. It doesn't matter. If I didn't die here, who am I gonna die? Because she said that you know it's gonna get uh, infected or whatever. It's frozen. It's it's a bad shape. I said, I don't let you cut it. I don't. And uh, and I know that uh, another girl, she was 22 years old, and she let and and then she never walked right because she didn't have a big toe. Did you get back to your apartment and and start a new life there? No. We uh, we we went to my own. As, as I said, we went to my uncle, and and that was the beautiful happy place and the court, and and it had bathroom and it had our beds and it had everything, and uh, uh, of course we went to see our apartment, and our apartment. My uncle told me told us that that our apartment is a is a terrible place and we went there and uh, they took even the uh, door frames and everything else because they figured that because it was a ghetto some people might have slipped there something I don't know what by the time we didn't have anything so it was I don't know what where, where, where would we get it but, but anyway doesn't matter uh, so uh, in order to put our place in order, you would need money. We didn't have no money. So uh, we, uh, amongst this group of women, uh, the ten women, was my father's cousin, uh, first cousin. Uh, and her apartment was on the other side of the city, so a different area. And uh, so she was with us in the ghetto, but her apartment was a beautiful apartment, and somebody just occupied it and uh, claimed it and occupied it and everything else. And when she came back, she said, out. And uh, they had to give it back to her. And uh, she said, look, her husband didn't come and she had two boys and they didn't come back uh, and uh, she said it's a big apartment what am I going to do by myself so uh, the three of us uh, move and plus her cousin from the other side from her mother's side because uh, she was a citrum girl uh, so from her mother's side, a, a cousin came back, a, a guy whose wife didn't come back. And so we, we each had a room and, and, uh, and uh, moved together. I'd like to hear about how you um, met your husband. And we can continue that in the next round. Um, can we um, talk about how you met your husband? Uh, well, I I knew my husband ever since I was in uh, in fifth grade, I think. Uh, he uh, his uncle had a source of getting raw material for the knitwear. As, as I told you before, uh, it was very difficult to get. It was a war, and, and, uh, and uh, it was difficult even for other people, but for Jewish people it was almost impossible. But he had a source, and he sold my, my uh, father uh, wool for yarn, uh, various kinds of yarn. 
And, uh, but at that point, I think Jews didn't even have a phone. So uh, my husband-to-be, who was a young man at that point, uh, used to come and talk to my father, whatever his uncle said, and take it back from my father, whatever my father said, uh, because there was no phone. Uh, I don't think that, 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 I think that's what happened. Or the phone first, it wasn't safe, and then, then there was no phone. To that end, there was no phone. And so he used to come and talk to my father at the apartment. And uh, when he was finished with my father, he used to make it his business to go through the day. Uh, we had like a, a place where we did the studying, and that was like a, uh, like a living room. Or a, it wasn't a fancy room. It was a, a, a kind of everyday room. And uh, usually my brother and myself, we used to study there. And uh, somehow or the other, he always went out that way. And then he would keep his hand on the handle of the door and talk to me for a couple of hours. And uh, our uh, housekeeper said, Ruzi, he likes you. I said, you are crazy. He's a grown-up. What would he like me? He liked to talk to me. He really liked to talk to me. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I read I was reading the same book as he was reading, or he was reading the same book as I was reading. The library was like a half a block from uh, our place, so I, uh, I I lived in the, you know, I was there almost every day, and, and uh, uh, I guess I lived with those books. That was my salvation. And uh, so after that, we, we were in the ghetto. They fell in the ghetto, too, so they were not... Uh, uh, and I never met his mother or, or his family, only him and his, his uncle, because his uncle had business with my father, and, and, and him because he came and, and went, you know. But anybody, nobody, I didn't know anybody from his family. So what, did, what made him decide? And when, when people came back, slowly but surely, uh, all through that summer of this 45, uh, mind you, uh, the war wasn't over until May of '45, and uh, and uh, some people were uh, uh, deep in Germany or, or uh, you know way over in the west. So it took some time until people kind of trickled back. The few people who survived, anyway. And uh, my husband to be, he. He survived, uh, and, and he was liberated in Dachau, which is uh, a famous concentration camp in Germany, uh, or was. And uh, uh, when he came home, you, you know, everybody who, who came home, that's how I, I got to my uncle. That was the first question, who is there, who is there? And uh, I think maybe there was some place, a list of... Uh, of uh, maybe at a joint where uh, I said that there was a, some kind of a distribution and uh, people first got there because we didn't have a, a reg. So uh, uh, it was, uh, I don't know if they had a list of people or, or I, I, I wasn't. Uh, but he heard that my mother and myself, we are back. So he came to visit. And after that, he came always to visit. And uh, and a couple of times, and I went back to school. I uh, I went back to school uh, in '45 yet. And '45, I did one grade. Not, uh, I can't say that I learned that much, but I I have a certificate that I finished. And then the next year, I went to to finish high school. And uh, uh, so uh, I didn't 
figure that I'm going to get married or anything like that. And uh, he asked me a couple of times, and I said, crazy. But what? And, uh, but then when my mother decided that she's going to get married, then I said, okay, I get married first. And I did. I knew him, and, and, uh, and, uh, and I felt comfortable doing that. Were you in love with him? No. I didn't really know what love would mean or, 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 or what anything would mean. I, I, that part of my education was missing because you grow up like to a girl, to be a girl. You be a, you're a little teenager, a little, you know, you, you, you snicker or you behind the boys, you do this or you do that. Well, I never did that and we never did that uh, uh, with my friends, you know, because we were, I don't see, you know, it's 1941. They took the first person from my class they deported her to uh, Poland because her father wasn't born. Her mother was from that illustrious family like, uh, like my history teacher. Uh, she was a pastor line, which, uh, girl, which was uh, one of the most intellectual families of my city. But uh, the husband, was uh, grew up there, but came after the first war, uh, the first war, and uh, uh, was born. I don't know where, but it wasn't born in in Hungary. So that was the first person who was deported, and we knew that she did not have. She she did not survive. And uh, so uh, all this, I mean, I, I don't remember, and I, I, I don't want to dwell on the shadows that, that came into our daily life, you know, uh, all those times in, in the 1940s. Uh, what did we know and what didn't we know and what came, you know, the refugees started to come, people who escaped from Poland, from Germany, from, you know, they went the wrong way, I guess, to go to the east, but they went whichever way they could. And uh, yeah. and some, people, some of them survived because they went and they went until some liberation came. And uh, so why did you get married? Because I didn't, uh, I couldn't figure that I can have a stepfather. I, I couldn't figure that I could live with somebody other than my father. And I, and I figured I, I was old enough, or I, I don't know what I figured. I have a marriage license. It says that the mother of the, of the minor uh, bride consented to this marriage. So that's, that's what I'm famous for. And where did you live after you got married? Uh, we uh, we lived in a in a very nice apartment in in in, uh, in the apartment where where the uncle who whom he represented to my father uh, who did not come back uh, used to live, and uh, it was a nice apartment except that the Russians took part of it uh, subsequently. And uh, and I, I I went the first year I went to school and the second year I, I didn't go to school but we we fled the second year the second I, I, where year did and a half. We where fled. did you fled we, we fled in the night uh, with a, uh, just a, 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 back, a backpack and that's all because uh, uh, the uncle I mean his family had this. Uh, uh, Factory of uh, it was called Fulger that had a name, and uh, uh, door uh, door uh, hinges and uh, locks, a certain type of locks and hinges. You know, uh, there weren't too many factories such as that uh, in that area. So uh, 
uh, that when my husband came back, even so he was not before uh, uh, associated with the factory. Uh, he op reopened the factory and, and got the people who used to work there and gave, you know. And, uh, and uh, he, he was very successful. He got raw material, which was difficult, and, and, and they started to work. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, there was a big need for that because uh, there was nobody around. So that you couldn't get locks and, and hinges and stuff like that. So uh, the, the merchants were very happy that oh, finally there is some place to get a merchandise that they can sell. And uh, so, uh, where was your brother in all of this? What? Where was your brother in, in all of this? My brother was taken to Paris with a, kid, with a ch uh, child transport from camp. Uh, and he was uh, there until uh, 45, 40, 46. He was there till 46. Uh, he wasn't there when I got married. Uh, uh, he, he, he figured that nobody arrived, you know, and, and, uh, and, and he, this family wanted to adopt him, and uh, he went to school. Uh, and, uh, but through the, I don't know if it was UG, uh, I mean, uh, joint or, or, or uh, highest or, uh, but there was a whole network of, uh, you sent letters, you did this, you did that, you know, you, you were looking for people. And we were, I was looking for every, for him and for my brother, but then finally, for my uh, father, but then uh, his, uh, his other cousin, he came and he told us the story about what happened to him. So I wasn't looking for him anymore, but I was still looking for my brother. And uh, so my brother got our, uh, somehow, he could, uh, someplace we got uh, the mail together. And then uh, these people were very nice and they brought him back. Actually, uh, the lady who wanted to uh, adopt uh, the couple, the, the, the woman, before she was married to uh, Mr. Philip, uh, she was uh, the girlfriend of Rakoshi, which, who was the prime minister of Hungary at that point, a, a communist. And uh, so she got per permission to come back, you know, she got a visa, which people didn't at that point, and brought my brother back to Budapest, to Hungary. And my mother went and uh, brought him back to our city. And, uh, and so he, started, he went to, back to school. You know, we, we, we were famous for school business. Uh, he started, uh, uh, he did, I think, two years in Paris uh, in a French school. And, and then here he went to a, a, a trade school, actually very good state school and uh, uh, so he he was back to our city until until the until we we fled because uh, they were threatening my husband to kill him because he wasn't giving them potatoes and he said well, I, I don't have potatoes they said, sell your dollars he does, I don't have dollars. Sell your gourd. I don't have gourd. I just came from the concentration camp. I don't have anything. I'm giving you a job. Well, that that wasn't enough. And uh, one day I, I was call, I came from home school and I, I called him to find out what time he's coming for lunch. And and, and I I hear this. Uh, they are threatening him with death or or worse. And uh, then when he came home, he said. He said, you know, this is the communists are taking over. I said, you know what? He said, yeah, we are leaving. It was, uh, it, we both came to the conclusion. Even so, it was hard to leave my mother uh, over there and, uh, and my brother. But then my brother went uh, 
uh, with the youth organization to Palestine at, at that time. But he was caught and he went to Cyprus and uh, didn't get to Palestine, you know, he didn't get to Palestine until nine, the beginning of, before, just before the State of Israel was proclaimed. He went to the, they, t- they took a boatload of children and he fell under that category. So that's how he got to Palestine. Where does he live now? Uh, right now he lives, uh, he has an apartment in Stockholm, Sweden, and he has an apartment in Farsaba, Israel. I mean, they have an apartment, my sister-in-law and my brother. And they have a family? Uh, yes. He has a daughter who lives in Farsaba, that's why they have the apartment there, and he has a son who lives in New York. I don't, I think you, you know him. Oh, maybe not. And uh, and uh, they have three grandchildren in New York and three grandchildren in Israel. <laughs> well, the ones in the Israel are, uh, well, they are big, I know, bigger, kind of. Uh, in New York, is only one in high school. The other two are already in college. And in Israel, uh, they are older. They already have a great-grandson. Tell me about your trip from um, Aradia to New York. How did that come about, or to Philadelphia? Well, the trip, we, we lived in Bregenz in Austria. And uh, in Innsbruck, there was a joint, uh, there was either joint or higher I don't really know. There was a Jewish organization. And uh, they were uh, arranging for people to go to wherever, to, to, I, I think wherever. But uh, as I said, um, my husband only grew up that he's going to America. Eventually he was going to America, even when he wasn't, uh, there wasn't possibility, he was still going to America. That's, uh, that's how he grew up. And uh, so he went to uh, this uh, office and they, uh, and because he, he, had, he was the textile engineer, they got him a contract to force him on Walden's. And uh, of course, in that case, we got a, a visa. And uh, we were supposed to come the year before, but I got pregnant. And uh, it uh, wasn't safe. Uh, I, I didn't have a easy pregnancy at all. I, it wasn't safe for me, so they wouldn't take me. And uh, so they said, when the child is three months old, then you can come. Okay, so that's what we did. And uh, uh, we went from Bregenz to München, or Munich, as in English. And uh, from there, the American, because we had a visa, the the Flying Tiger, which was uh, kind of a a private uh, organization that flew some of the Soldiers, I, I, I am not familiar with exactly how it, it worked, but it was the Flying Tiger uh, Company that flew us from Munich to the United States, except that over the Atlantic we lost, a, we lost an engine. Uh, this was before, uh, uh, you know, airplanes were on two engines, you know, and, and, and uh, they couldn't fly otherwise. And uh, so we landed in Iceland. And uh, we, we were three days in Iceland, and then uh, we were, uh, we, we came to uh, JFK, which was the Idlewild at that point, not JFK. And uh, from there, the people from Passaic came and took us from to Passaic, and we uh, we lived in Passaic for uh, uh, about eight months, and then we 
got in contact with the family in Philadelphia, and, and uh, my husband decided we'd go to Philadelphia, and we did. And that's where we landed. And then you became someone who's um, famous for owning a food company. Is well, that was later. How much later was that? That was uh, about three years, three years later. We, uh, as uh, in the beginning, uh, my husband's family gave uh, him, uh, he started a business, a store, with appliances and limited amount of furniture, but mostly appliances, refrigerators, uh, uh, washers and uh, stuff, uh, except that they neglected to tell him that uh, they are charging him the retail price. So he couldn't be successful. He was successful in, in getting the people, but then when they heard how much, they said, we'll be back tomorrow. And they never came back tomorrow. So this is uh, how it worked. And, uh, and then he wanted to be a, a, life, a, a life insurance agent. And he tried that, but that did not agree with him because when you sell life insurance, you have to talk about death. Uh, and, and especially at that point, today there is annuities and all kinds of, but at that time, uh, life insurance was life insurance. And uh, he, he just couldn't do that. He was very sensitive. And uh, so he did not succeed with that. We didn't succeed, he didn't succeed with the, uh, with the appliance. And, uh, and, uh, and we had to kind of make a living. And he said, well, if you just help me with this once. And uh, I said, sure, anything you want. And uh, he said, well, you're very famous with your chopped liver. Anybody who comes and you serve them chopped liver, they said they never had anything like it. So he said, why don't you make chopped liver and try to sell it? I didn't see it in the store anyway. And so I said, okay. So I started to make chopped liver. And, uh, and uh, then uh, we rented a, a, a butcher store and, and, uh, because it had a walk-in cooler. And uh, and I had one employee, and 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 I started to make chopped liver, but uh, it wasn't. Uh, it was a it was a business that you could live, but you could never get any place. And uh, uh, this that was the time when the supermarket started every week. Uh, there was one more opening up someplace or the other in the city. And I, uh, I went to the supermarket to shop, and, and I realized that they don't have anything that I am making in their case. They have a deli case, but they don't have those things. And uh, I wanted to find out so from a, a salesman who sold us uh, boxes. I found out that uh, the supermarket each has uh, a buying day. Each buyer has a buying day, uh, one day of the week, uh, and the deli buyer has a week has a buying day. Uh, this one on Wednesday and that one on Thursday, and and I figured. Uh, and so I went. Uh, I went with a little container of chopped liver, and and I said uh, that I am making this, and and uh, and. Uh, would you be interested? And they tasted it, and they said, it, oh, it's delicious, it's delicious. But we can't really buy it from you because you have a little place, and, and uh, how can you assure us that uh, you're always going to be the same? You know, one week it's going to be a little salty, one week it's going to be uh, a little this, a little that. And uh, I really don't know how I got to that. But I said to the guy that this is an item you don't have. You're not giving me a penny. You can put it in. And the week that you're not satisfied, you can throw me out. We don't have a contract. And what did you lose? You might, you might gain a good item. And if I'm not good, then I fall on my face. And he did it. 
And then I went to the other supermarket, which was smaller, and I said, I sold it to the food fair. Oh, the food fair has it. Then the one who had 23 stores, oh, he wanted to have it, but the other one had 45 stores. So, okay. So he put it in, you know, and this is how we go. And then what happened was that they each had a, had a commissary, what they called commissary, and they made all kinds of things. But they grew too big, and that commissary was not uh, viable anymore. For a few stores, they could supply a few stores, but they couldn't supply so many stores uh, with professional items. And uh, every once in a while, they would call up and they would say, uh, could you make us a good roast beef? Uh, because uh, our commissary, you know, with it. I said, sure. Didn't have an oven. Didn't know what he's talking about. I went to the chef at the commissary and I said, uh, he called me and, and he said that I would make and you can't make it because it's, you're too busy. What did you make? So he said, I made this. And he said, uh, so I got an oven, I got, uh, and I, I learned how to make it. That's all. Who financed you along the way? Nobody. Nobody. It's, uh, we borrowed from a fellow the, the newcomer, you know, a, a, friend, a friend of ours, a thousand dollars, and we bought two, two machinery, two pieces of machinery, was a thousand dollars, and that's how I started. And who helped you in the kitchen? I, uh, there was a, a, a woman, a Russian woman, who actually was folk Deutsch. Uh, Peter the Great, sometimes way back in antiquity, took in to Russia a lot of tradespeople from Germany, uh, people who knew not, and and she was from that group, a descendant of that group. She spoke a perfect German, and uh, she, a couple times when uh, I, 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 I moved to a department and I had to clean and everything else, somebody said, you can get her, and I got her to help me. And when I started working, I said, would you like to have a job? Didn't have anything, but uh, I wanted to give her a job. And I gave her a job, and that was my first employee. And what was the name, and what is the name of your company? Mrs. Ressler's Food. My husband named it. And at that point, there was Mrs. Smith's Pie and uh, Mrs. Paul's Fish Stick. And he said, the Mrs. Ressler's Food is very right. And that's what it's, it was called, and that's what it's called still. And what do you distribute? We don't, uh, we make and distribute, what, uh, we don't distribute other things, but we just uh, uh, process uh, uh, meats and uh, poultry. And, uh, like what? Like roast beef, corned beef, uh, pastrami, uh, and uh, uh, turkey breast, turkey roll, chicken breast, uh, all kinds of varieties of, of the same. Yeah, I mean, you know, the same kind of thing, but various ways of uh, doing it, various uh, flavors. How many people do you employ? Uh, about 150. Thank you. We'll pick up again. Okay. Okay. Rolling. As you think about the past, your life before and during and post-war, and the, all of these experiences that you have had, what has been the most meaningful for you? Uh, my most meaningful was that I survived with my mother, that uh, that was the number one, I feel, that uh, that was 
a real great luck from fate and uh, uh, my meaningful was to come to the United States and live here freely and being able to do whatever my limited talents allowed me to do and uh, and the big plus you just start coming in uh, my child my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren that is my greatest accomplishment how many grandchildren do you have I have four grandchildren or eight right now because both spouses are my grandchildren and I have nine great-grandchildren and one hopefully any day now which is a number 10. And how many children do you have? One child only. So she was very fruitful and I thank her very much. Do you believe in God? Yes. I, I believe in, in some super force that, uh, that uh, not necessarily the parochial God that uh, uh, I can't figure out that there are so many gods that every religion has a different God. So somehow I have to believe that there is just one God that everybody can pray in uh, like in the Bible says that uh, everybody should pray in their uh, language, but, uh, but pray that God should not punish and, and the ship should come in uh, safely. So I feel that all the people, whichever way they pray, and uh, whatever language they pray, and whatever God they pray to, I think that there must be just one God somehow. If you were to carry through with a message for your children, your, your grandchildren, your family, great-grandchildren, what would be the message that you would like to leave them as part of the legacy of your life? Well, I hope that they stay Jewish. I am not certain that that is the smartest way to be. Uh, after the Holocaust, I had uh, my doubts that uh, maybe history always repeats itself somehow or the other, not necessarily the same way. And uh, when I look at my uh, place where I was born and I, I, I hear how uh, anti-Semitism is today is a natural thing so many years after the Holocaust. I'm not sure that it never comes back. But on the other hand, I feel that if anything the Germans did, they beat it into me. I should be proud that I am what I am. I can't be anything else. And I hope that the generations that come after me we are kind of follow the tradition. Not necessarily anything else, but they will know where they come from and, and where they are going. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. This is what we're, we're going to do, and then you can all leave, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, 
Mrs. Ressler is going to introduce everybody. Mrs. Ressler is going to introduce everybody. And then I'm going to um, ask um, Kitty and Lisa. Lisa is. I'm a grand, great grand. I'm a granddaughter. Yeah. Okay. I know. Okay. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Kitty and Lisa um, a couple of questions, and I don't, I'm not going to tell you what they are because I want them over the, you know, you off the cuff. Live dangerous. Live dangerous. Who's Crunching? It's crunching? You thought I was a child here. Who did that? You're crunching. I already told him he was a child. So we're rolling. Okay. Um, anytime. Oh, well, okay. For posterity's purpose, you're a child. Yeah. Yeah. Mrs. Ressler, would you like to please introduce us to your I lovely would be family? I'm very glad to. And from left to right is uh, uh, Danny, Elisa, and May, and Naomi. Naomi is my oldest granddaughter. Great 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 Eve, Lila, and uh, Emily was my youngest granddaughter. My daughter, her husband Joe, and Eliana, Ayla, that's my bar mitzvah boy, Jacob, mm -hmm. Graham, Tali, Eve, and we will come back to Naomi. <laughs> In the background is Teddy and Lori and uh, David and Hillary and Michael. And and back to, back to Danny. Back to Danny. Okay. <laughs> she couldn't see exactly. Oh. I, I can't turn my head. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like person okay. <laughs> Who works with you at Mrs. Ressler's Food? Uh, we, we are a three generation company. Uh, Joe, uh, David. David, Michael, and Hillary. Uh, and Emily. Emily. <laughs> and Emily. Sorry. <laughs> How many people do you employ? About 150, I think. I'd like to ask Kitty how she feels about uh, her mother's success and how she feels about growing up as the child of a Holocaust survivor. Kitty, I can't see you. Can you? Can you? Uh, go to your daughter. Well, I, I think it's wonderful um, as far as my mother's success and everyone in the business success. Um, my husband and my father, and um, and as far as growing up as a Holocaust a child, a Holocaust survivor, um, I know that's a really difficult question for me to answer. Um, Was there anything that you felt was different than for you? Can, I, can we pause? There's some, I think some Velcro or something. Somebody. It's Grant. 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 Don't stop. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> this is your show. Was there anything different in the way you were raised from your friends whose parents were not Holocaust survivors that you would like to tell us about? Um, well, I was an only child, which is, I guess, most of my friends in those days, there weren't that many that were single children. Um, also, because my parents worked, um, when I was younger, I went to like a private school where sometimes I, you know, I was there for dinner or supper or things like that. So, but then when we moved to Brumal, um, 
I didn't. I went to regular public school. And I guess in those days it was unusual to have um, your mother working. Most of my friends, maybe Did later on. <coughs> She's hidden behind her. Yeah. 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 You're totally blocked to the um, camera, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, do you want to put her down or what, whatever? Yeah, come over to mommy. Good I'm job. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, good job. Come here. She gets you on me. Um, anyway, I, uh, I don't know where I was. Um, when you moved to Korea, I moved. You had your yes, passport. most most of my friends, their their mothers didn't really work, um, except maybe if they were a school teacher, something like that. They were home at the hours. Um, but, you know, other than that, <laughs> I think I, I don't think there's anything else. Did you have her help your mother in, in her work, mother and father? Um, well, sometimes yeah. I did. I, um, I remember there were times when, you know, they tried for holidays to do, so I remember going in and peeling eggs for, for um, chopped liver or um, forming the patties for the gefilte fish. They used to make gefilte fish at one one time. Um, so I do recall doing that. And, um, and then later on, um, I, in the I helped in the office for, um, for a year before I went to Israel. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And Lisa, having a grandmother who um, is a Holocaust survivor and a grandfather as well, do you think that that particular background has made you a different kind of person or a different kind of a Jew? I think that's hard to answer because I don't know what I would have been otherwise. Um, but I think definitely there's an impact uh, from the Holocaust and that the legacy and the generations that, that come after the people that have survived um, their lives are changed and different in many ways. So, um, so yeah, it has you know, it's definitely affected our family, um, and not only you know my grandparents, but my, but my mom, and also as as grandchildren, and then um, and and also my children. So the goal is for legacies to just repeat the things that are. Um, that you want to repeat, and um, so Holocaust survivors tend to stick close, and that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, okay, can I, yeah, if you don't mind, um, I think one of the things um, that has made us, we all want to live close to each other, and you know, we all um, kind of know how important family is, I think that probably was contributed. Um, just on a light note, I know my mom always talked about how her parents cut food differently. Um, they were from Europe, and they always cut food differently than because uh, they used the the knife in a different hand in Europe. So that was probably from. Uh, uh, and so that was uh, on a light note. She always mentioned that to me. I didn't know that. Yeah, and that when she went to people's houses when she was younger, she said she would notice that everyone else was eating differently and that she would adjust. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else who would like to say something about being part of Susie Restless family? Dave? Well, I can certainly say um, I can kind of bring in the, the business side of it now, you know, being third generation along with Michael and Emily, um, and running a, running a business that, that Susie started along with our grandfather, Emmy, um, comes up often. You know, I, I uh, get involved in sales and, and I, you know, often it's a, it's a good story to tell about the success that they had and, and starting the business and growing the business, you know, from you know, coming coming from surviving the Holocaust and coming to a brand new country and starting over, and uh, it's definitely you know shaped the company in a lot of ways. So uh, it's it's 
it's definitely there every day. Would you like your children to continue in the company? If they want to, <laughs> you know, it would be, um, you know, something that would certainly be a possibility, but um, would definitely have to be their, their choice. Well, you have a way to go, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so very much. It's been a great privilege for us to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for your question. <laughs> this is a picture of my parents, my brother, and myself. Uh, I would judge that sometimes in the 30s, and since he has long hair, his hair was cut when he was three. Up till then, it was not cut. So since it has a, like a, almost a girl's hairdo, I would judge that it's uh, maybe 33, 1933. This is the, the house where we were in the ghetto and uh, where uh, we, we lived just before concentration camp. Uh, this is uh, the 16, number 16, uh, I don't really know the Romanian name of it, which is today is some kind of a Romanian name. It was number 16 anyway, it is still number 16. It's a current picture, not a picture that I had before. But the house looked the same. There is not much difference. Uh, this is a picture of my mother and her six siblings. She was the only daughter and she had six brothers. Uh, in the background, from left to right, Lajos, Miklos, Ferry, Jenő, Béla, and Józsi. Józsi is the, was the firstborn. Judging from the picture of my mother and, and uh, the youngest brother, I would judge that it was the uh, beginning of the tw 1920s. Uh, uh, I, none of them are alive today. Uh, uh, three of them were killed uh, during the Shoah, and the other three died uh, since, uh, of old age, I suppose, or something, but none of them. This is a picture of my grandmother, my mother's mother. Uh, she had violet eyes, bur purple eyes. She was very pretty, famous for her beauty. Uh, her name was Gisela or Golda. Uh, and this picture was taken in 1943, just very shortly before uh, the Shoah. She was killed in Auschwitz in 1944. This is a picture of my first cousin, Irinka, taken uh, Sometimes in the late 30s, uh, she was very pretty, uh, young girl, killed in 1944 in Auschwitz. This is a picture of my old graduation from the seventh grade. Uh, as you can see, we have 52 students, and we learned very well. So uh, the size of the class is not as important as how much you want to learn. This is a picture of my brother and myself. I think it dates about 1943, just before the show. And, uh, I'm glad to say that we are both still alive. Yeah, this is a picture of my husband and myself. Uh, I believe it was uh, just before Lisa's wedding, which is about 15 years ago. And uh, I believe this is the last picture of him that you can see the old uh, man. Yeah, smiling the way he did with some sense. Uh, 
after that, she, he had Alzheimer and uh, it wasn't that good. Uh, he died in 2004.